And here we are, folks, the grand finale of How Incredibles 2 Destroyed Everything. We've spent almost three full hours at this point extensively breaking down the first two acts of this movie and how laughably dysfunctional the plot is, how pathetically weak its themes are, how frustratingly incongruent its world building is, and how embarrassingly its characters have been put through the ringer. But all of that's gonna come to a head in this third and final act. The reveal of Evil Endeavor's motivations, the lead-up to the finale, and the climax itself. All of which will be demonstrating the ineptitude of our characters and their story at their absolute worst. We've got a lot of ground to cover over the next almost two hours. So let's get this train wreck started. Bob wakes up the next morning after dropping Jack-Jack off at Edna's place and heads over there to pick him up. And now, at long last, we are finally going to get an explanation for his exponential number of overpowered abilities. But sadly, said explanation only makes things much, much worse than they were before. It is not unknown for supers to have more than one power when young, but this little one has many. It is not unknown for supers to have multiple powers when they're infants, meaning it is a possibility, but it is also still clearly an anomaly for Jack-Jack to have this many powers, since Edna makes a point of him being an outlier when it comes to super babies. So not only did Bob and Helen get insanely lucky two times in a row with both Dash and Violet not having multiple powers when young, otherwise there'd be no reason for Bob to be surprised by Jack-Jack and all this drama couldn't happen, but they also got insanely lucky with their third kid and that this baby's the super special one. Apparently, out of all the superheroes in all the world, having the amount of powers that Jack-Jack does is an extreme rarity, meaning that it is an astronomical stroke of luck that it happened to be one of their kids gifted with this many abilities, and that it happened to be the third baby because if it were any of the other kids, or if it wasn't any of them at all, then the entire climax that we're about to start ramping up to could never happen. But for as much as this conversation breaks the story even more, I do appreciate this little piece of continuity when Edna places Jack-Jack in the chamber and shows off her work to Bob, which by the way, there's deja vu. But seriously, listen to this. I often work to music and I notice the baby responds to it as well, specifically Mozart. A callback to Jack-Jack attack with Mozart music being what Kari played to tame Jack-Jack. It's a small detail, but a neat one nonetheless. Here's a much less neat small detail. Combustion imminent? What does that mean? Fire, Robert. Apparently, Bob doesn't know what the word combustion means. Because isn't it just hilarious how stupid he is? But more important than that, you see that little remote thingy that Bob's holding? Well, as it turns out, over the course of a single night, Edna not only gained a perfect understanding of all of Jack-Jack's abilities, how they work, what triggers them, and how to appropriately handle them, but she managed to execute on all of that information by designing and building a suit that's comfortable for a baby to wear, and that contains countermeasures for each of these abilities, including technology capable of tracking Jack-Jack as he navigates an alternate dimension, and programmed a remote capable of keeping track of all these things, detecting them, and mitigating their effects in a single night. You know what I have to say to that? You are a liar! You are feeding me nothing but falsities, movie. You sit upon a throne of lies. You are telling me a hilarious joke if you want me to believe Edna accomplished all of that in one night. Especially because we know from the Auntie Edna short film that most of her time was spent trying not to die or have her house be destroyed at the hands of Jack-Jack. Hey, by the way, does that sound familiar to anybody? There's deja vu. Rather than actively studying his abilities. And by the time he finally calmed down, he was already asleep. She wasn't going to be performing any analysis on him during that time period because he's not going to activate his superpowers while he's asleep. How in the world did you do this so quickly and so effectively? And I really do not want to understate that alternate dimension thing. Jack-Jack has the ability to transport himself to an alternate dimension, which is already just and Edna created a remote that can monitor his movements in this alternate dimension and anticipate where and when he's going to reappear into ours. Literally how? I don't know that you could have made this work if you had a full year to work on it, let alone a few hours. Also, when Bob gets home and shows off Jack-Jack to the kids, he also has learned a new skill. The ability to control Jack-Jack with verbal commands. Ready? Ah. Laser eyes. Stop. You what? Okay. Blaster ready? <laughs> how did how? Actually, how did you do that? That remote is tailor designed to be able to control uncontrollable events. It didn't train him like a dog ready to do tricks for treats. How was he even able to be trained when he was sleeping the entire time Edna was working on this? Did Bob do that today after he got home since he went there in the morning, but now it's nighttime? If that's the case, then my criticism would simply shift to You did that in a day? He's a baby! How in Syndrome's name did you gain this level of mastery over his powers in one single day? And why did you bother telling me that? Any solution involving cookies will inevitably result in the demon baby. 
only to then show Dash give Jack Jack a cookie one scene later and have him not turn into a demon baby. I, I don't understand what's going on anymore. But if you want to talk about not understanding what's going on, oh, buddy, you're in for a treat with this next scene. Because as you may recall from last time, Evil Endeavor revealed herself to be the screen slaver and took control of Helen's mind. Which means that now it's time for us to jump back over to that storyline and listen to her big evil plan. For those of you who don't already know, the motivations of the villain for Incredibles 2 may very well be the most infamously badly written part of this movie. Her plan is so blatantly idiotic that it makes Annabelle's actions in Toy Story 4 look logical by comparison. I think I'm actually willing to say definitively at this point that Evil Endeavor is one of the most horrifically badly written villains in cinematic history, and definitely the worst villain in Pixar's catalog. So if you've seen this movie before, you likely already know all about what I'm gonna say here. But if you're new to the world of Incredibles 2, or if you just want a bit of a refresher on how stupid this is, then sit back and relax while I rip the screen slaver to shreds. To begin with, I bet you're curious why she decided to target the poor little pizza guy as her red herring screen slaver. But it doesn't bother you that an innocent man is in jail? Eh, he was surly. And the pizza was cold. The... the pizza was... cold? You... You targeted this guy because the pizza he had no hand in making was cold when it got to your house. That is Doofenshmirtz levels of pettiness. Whatever, Evelyn then proceeds to explain her emotionally scarring backstory to Helen. See, her parents could have easily survived that break and had they simply chosen to go to the safe room instead of calling for superheroes to come to the rescue. As a result, she blames superheroes, or more specifically, she blames how superheroes have made people dependent on them to help solve problems as opposed to taking matters into their own hands for the death of her parents, and labels her brother a child for blaming their parents' death on the fact that superheroes have been outlawed, and so she has now made it her life's mission to make sure superheroes never become legal. Wow. So, uh, show of hands, can anybody out there think of any obvious contradictions between what we just heard and the events that have unfolded in this movie prior to this point? Because I've got a few I could mention. First of all, how hysterically ironic is it that she calls her brother a child for conflating the death of their parents with the banning of superheroes, while she's doing the exact same thing in reverse by saying that because of people's over-reliance on superheroes, their parents died, and now she's based her entire plan around the goal of making superheroes illegal forever. You're no less a child than your brother, with the obvious difference being that he has the mental capacity to understand that superheroes are very clearly a net positive for society, which is something that you have been helping him prove all this time! Which leads me to my next point. What the hell have you been doing this whole movie, you dopey twit? Why have you been wasting time actively helping your brother prove how great superheroes are for society? Before you stepped in with your plan to change people's perceptions of superheroes, there was never any risk of them ever being made legal again, and it was only because of your actions in this film that your life's mission is now at risk. The Screen Slaver and Evelyn Dever are two characters who are completely at odds with each other, yet we're supposed to believe the latter was in control of the former's decisions the entire time. The Screen Slaver is a character who created situations specifically designed for Helen to be able to win and ultimately save the day. But Evelyn Dever is a character who wants to prove how worthless superheroes are. These two things cannot possibly coexist with one another. Everything the Screen Slaver has done up until this point has been actively detrimental to what Evelyn wants. I've seen people try to argue against this criticism by saying that, ah, don't you see? She had to play along with her brother's plan, so she subtly manipulated events behind the scenes to try to sabotage him. Well, unfortunately, there are a few problems with that. First of all, her plan to make superheroes illegal, again, revolves around making sure that Elastigirl survives all these encounters and making it to the signing ceremony in one piece so that she can turn her against the city on live TV. So trying to sabotage her clearly was not something that she was trying to do. Second of all, if her goal all this time was to sabotage Elastigirl and make sure she doesn't succeed, she sure did an awful job trying to do so. For starters, There's a shortcut. Cut through the culvert up ahead. I probably wouldn't tell her about the shortcuts that would make trying to stop the hover train easier. I also probably wouldn't only take over one of the helicopters. I would probably take over all three of them to guarantee either that she dies in an explosion or that she is unable to save the ambassador due to having too many helicopters to deal with before the pilots all suicide bomb them into the ground. It's pretty clear that her goal all along was to get to the point where Winston plans on gathering superheroes and world leaders all onto the boat, and then killing them all horribly through the mind-controlled superheroes to permanently tarnish the name of superheroes forever. 
ever, so sabotaging her along the way couldn't have been her goal, and if it was her goal, she basically picked all the worst ways to try to do that. Having said that, I would also like to point out that there's a major oversight with her plan to create the situations for Elastigirl to solve while also making sure she survives. Because she clearly needs her alive for the final act of this movie, that makes this entire helicopter chase look monumentally idiotic because she came milliseconds away from dying at the hands of the chopper she had direct control over. Also, the whole idea that she was just forced to go along with the plan in the first place is fundamentally flawed. This campaign does not happen without Evelyn's technology. Without the motorcycle, soup cam, and tracker, Elastigirl can't stop the hover train, she can't find the fake evil lair, and she can't record any of it to be able to show people later. So since this plan can't happen without her technology, then all she would have to do to sabotage her brother would be to not provide him with the necessary technology to make it happen. Those suit cams were made by her. Designed to myself. As is the case with every other piece of technology she's used throughout this film. There was never any sabotage required. You brought this all on yourself the second you foolishly chose to go along with this plan. But you didn't need to do that because the public opinion, at least according to what the movie wants you to believe, was an absolute rock bottom at the beginning of this movie. If you had simply done nothing, everything would now be proceeding in an orderly fashion. Legally, superheroes were banned. And in the court of public opinion, everybody hated superheroes, apparently. So had you chosen to ignore Winston's plan and refuse to relinquish your technology, which wouldn't have exactly been out of character since you clearly previously had arguments with Winston about the parents choosing to call for superhero help. Dad could have taken Mom to the safe room as soon as he knew there was trouble. I disagree strongly! You would have had exactly what you wanted all along without having to do literally anything. Yet here you are, ranting about how your master plan is to make superheroes illegal despite the fact that they're already illegal. A fact that, by the way, only further disproves your entire modus operandi because if you think that people are too heavily dependent on superheroes, then how exactly do you think life has been proceeding as normal during their 15-year absence? There haven't been any superheroes around for people to look up to and rely on for help. How do you plan on reconciling that reality with this little line? Superheroes keep us weak! And as the cherry on top, the only reason any of this is happening at all is because of her father's brain-dead decision to not just put the phones into the goddamn safe room! Remember in the first episode when I mentioned how that little problem was going to be central to the villain's motivations? Well, here we are. It is entirely because her dad made the single stupidest possible decision two times in a row that this movie is allowed to happen at all. This is what I mean when I say that seemingly minor problems can cause major ripple effects elsewhere. Change that one detail of where the phones are located and the whole story falls apart at the seams. Not that it isn't already in tatters anyway, but you get my point. And I'm sure you've already heard all this before. As I said, the screen slaver is quite notorious for being horrifically written, thus bringing the whole movie down with her as the crux of the narrative that she is. But being widely known wasn't gonna stop me from breaking it all down. Also, do you love how this scene is literally the very thing the first movie pointedly and openly mocked? He starts monologuing. He starts <laughs> monologuing. He starts like this prepared speech yeah. about how feeble I am compared to him, <laughs> how inevitable my defeat is. You're gonna help me make supers illegal forever. And when I unleash you, <laughs> I'll get <laughs> You sly dog! You got me monologuing! I can't believe it! Our sweet parents were fools to put their lives in anybody else's hands! How are these scenes from the same series of films? How did this happen? Who wrote this? How was there not even an ounce of self-awareness when you guys were writing this sludge? You went from a nonchalant, reserved tech genius to an unhinged psychopath without even the slightest of justifications because we gotta get our twist villain in there! Back in 2004, you actively made fun of the cartoonish evil monologues that superhero villains tended to drone off on. Now here we are in the future and you've become the very thing you swore to destroy. Why would you even bother telling Helen any of this in the first place? If you kept her unconscious until your master plan was over, assuming that you allowed her to survive at all, then you at least had a small chance of convincing her you weren't the one to screen slave her because of how fast it had happened. But waking her up right now, specifically so that you can monologue your whole evil plan to her, just gives her all the reasons in the world to turn against you when you eventually take those goggles off after your plan is completed. And to conclude this verbal diarrhea, Evelyn wraps up her mom monologue and then reactivates the goggles to bring Helen back under her mind control. So surely this could never work, right? Evelyn takes her sweet ass time, slowly and dramatically getting ready to push the button, so you'd think that would give Helen more than enough time to, uh, oh, I don't know, close her eyes? The only thing she needs in order to control you is for you to be looking into the screen built into those glasses. All screen slaver needs to do to hypnotize someone is get a screen in front of their eyes. Meaning that if your eyes don't have a line of sight to the screens, they aren't gonna 
to work. If you had any functioning brain cells, you'd close your eyes and then do a diversion to pretend that you've been hypnotized, only to then turn against her the second she releases you from your restraints. I'll tell you this right now, the Helen I knew from the first movie absolutely would have thought to do that, given how clever and resourceful she was, as well as her ability to quickly adapt to whatever the situation required. But because everyone's an idiot now, they don't let her do that because otherwise our climax couldn't happen. Wonderful. Speaking of which, we are approaching the point of no return. We are about to cross a line where the action goes all out, balls to the walls insanity, and it is a non-stop chain of idiotic nonsense. So you might want to fasten your seatbelts. It's gonna be a real bumpy ride. Bob gets a call from Evelyn who tells him that Elastigirl's in trouble but doesn't tell him exactly what happened and he doesn't press more information because reasons unknown so he agrees to meet her on the ship at DevTech. And he calls in Lucius to watch the kids and then... Yeah, it's funny. Much like Edna's portrayal, it's a neat little callback that doesn't at all feel forced in just to appeal to the infamous meme-worthy scene that everybody talks about. Another round of points for this movie. But it's about to lose a whole lot more points than that, because when Bob arrives at the ship, Evelyn lures her into the room where Helen is waiting to attack him. And I have no shame in admitting that I immediately perked up in my seat as soon as I realized what was about to happen, because having Mr. Incredible do battle with Elastigirl is a fight with endless possibilities for how it could play out. How a super strong fighter would fare against an elastic fighter. Who would emerge victorious? How would their abilities play off each other? My eyes were fixated on the screen, chomping at the bit to see what was gonna happen with this epic battle. Unfortunately, it turns out to be the actual lamest thing I've ever seen, where Helen does a Sonic 06 and throws a bunch of random objects at Bob and then tries to suffocate him to death, all the while he does absolutely nothing but embarrass himself the entire time. Then he pulls her close, she tricks him into thinking he snapped her out of her trance, only for her to take goggles from Evelyn, and thus she has another mind-controlled hero on her team. What a waste of a potentially phenomenal fight. Why bother having two superheroes put each other's abilities to the maximum test we can turn one of them into a glorified marshmallow that just lets himself get the crap beaten out of him. Pathetic. Also, how was she even able to do any of this? When Evelyn was talking about the pizza guy earlier, she said, I gave you a pretty good fight through him. But how does that work? What does mind controlling someone actually entail? You clearly weren't in control of her movements because you were standing there the whole time just watching it happen. Yet you also imply earlier that the only reason the pizza guy was able to put up as determined of a fight as he did was because you were in charge of his brain like you're playing a video game, but how does that even work? And then again, later, we see you directly talking into the ears of the people you're trying to control. What does the mind controlling do? And it can't simply be the case that she gives them a general order like, attack this person, or do this thing, and then they behave autonomously from that point onward because there's not a snowball's chance in hell that logic could work for the helicopter attack earlier, when we can clearly see that these pilots have their eyes fixated on the screen at all times, they couldn't possibly competently fly the helicopters with this level of proficiency when they literally are not allowed to look through the window to see what's happening. Using that explanation would also therefore have to mean that the pizza guy is this proficient in combat entirely on his own, despite not having absolutely any reason to be able to stand even the slightest of chances against Elastigirl. This may be the explanation the movie wants you to believe in regards to the superhero she controls, but it does not work as a consistent rule whatsoever because it can't possibly apply to any of the other mind control situations throughout this movie. <sighs> okay, back at the house. Dash grabs the remote for the Incredible for literally no reason at all as Violet renounces her renunciation of superheroes just in time for when the plot needs her to become a superhero again. Fantastic! She suspects something's up with their parents and suits up along with Dash, ready to lend a hand and figure out what's going on, but surprise! They have a visitor! Whoever could it be? Oh my goodness. Hello there, little fella. Hey, little guy! <laughs> what the hell? Why are you- what?! Bob left the house like a minute ago at maximum, and then the knockoff superheroes immediately showed up as soon as he left, which also happens to be immediately before Frozone shows up at the house as well! Wow! That's all so convenient! This movie is allergic to slowing down for any reason at any time. They literally defied how calendar days work just to keep the plot moving along as quickly as possible because they want to speedrun their way through both the A and B storylines, no matter how absurdly impossible, or at best, unlikely, it is for all these things to be happening right after another so quickly. The knockoff superheroes tell Dash and Violet that they're not not safe and that the Devers sent them to protect the kids. Which is a hilarious lie to expect them to believe when you all look like you were born with hate in your hearts and you're about five seconds away from eating them. But as I said, Frozone shows up just in time to come to the rescue and is able to walk all the way through the crowd and into the house to put himself between the knockoffs and the kids? What? What are you Avengers rejects doing? Grab him! Evelyn clearly wants to capture Frozone as well because Void literally says a second later, The thing is, 
He wants us to bring you, too. Then why in the flappy wappy hell are you just casually letting him walk inside that house? There's no point in trying to be cordial or polite. Just throw the goggles onto them and bring them in. Don't sit there and tell them what you're going to do instead of actually doing it. Grab them! But no! They all just happily step out of the way and let him casually stroll into the house. Do 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 do. Actually, why did you even ring the doorbell in the first place? Why would you announce your presence to give them even the slightest chance of fighting back? We learned earlier that. The house has multiple hidden exits. And if it has secret exits, then those exits can also work as secret entrances, which Evelyn would obviously know about and know how to activate because this is a house the Devers own that they are currently loaning to the Incredibles. So why don't you use one of them to sneak into the house and get the jump on the kids? Also, last time I checked, there's a pretty gaping hole in the back of the house. Maybe if you did a little bit of recon, you'd have seen that and could have just gone in that way. Or if you really want to ring the doorbell so that you can guarantee that someone will come to the door and that you'll therefore know exactly where they'll be, then and at least use it as a distraction while someone sneaks up from behind! Split up! Divide and conquer! Don't funnel every single one of your teammates down the same entrance to make them an easy target of Frozone 2. <laughs> Exactly! Why are you all so utterly incompetent? Oh, by the way, Dash then proceeds to, what else? Push the summon button on the remote, so you better make sure you remember that for later. Pushing the summon button apparently also activates the rocket launches, because I guess that was the fastest route out of the house? Damn, that's some pretty advanced AI to have that level of pathfinding. And I still question the remote's ability to actually talk to that car from this far away, but whatever. So then Dash runs to grab Jack-Jack as the kids in Frozen all run to try to escape, but as they do, the knockoffs break free from their ice prison and... Spread out! You stupid fucks! Now you want to spread out? Out? Gee, it sure would have been helpful if you came up with that plan five seconds ago because you probably have captured them all by now if you did. Yeah, look at this! Every single one of these clowns was able to silently break into the house and surround them on all sides in a matter of seconds. Why didn't you do this earlier? And why on earth are you trying to electrify them? Why are you trying to vomit lava all over Dash to burn him to death when you said earlier that you need to bring these people in alive? Why are you trying to crush Violet, Dash, and the infant baby to death using her own force field? It makes sense for you to want to bring them in alive because it gets a lot harder to sell the idea that superheroes voluntarily and collectively chose to turn against humanity if there's evidence of a mysterious superhero v superhero battle in which some of them died, those being children, one of whom was an infant, and all of whom are the family of the superheroes that allegedly turned evil. But if you want to bring them in alive, then why are you constantly trying to kill them? Oh, but don't worry, everybody. They don't actually die because the Incredible burst through the walls to save the day. Gee, it sure is incredibly lucky that Dash randomly decided to grab that remote earlier or else they'd have been crushed to death. And it is beyond incredibly lucky that of all the things to be broadcast on TV during the scene that happened to be a news story about the Incredibile, and that the broadcast was even able to happen at all because the car just so happened to get auctioned off at this exact moment, otherwise Dash never would have known about it and therefore never would have thought to grab the remote in the first place. Wow, wow, Wubsy! Such brilliant writing and totally not contrived as shit. I also have no clue why it came through this random part of the wall when they're surrounded by a forest instead of just charging through the front door, but of course if it did that then they would have died and it wouldn't have been able to flatten the Crusher guy, so who cares? Also, pretty sure you're dead, my dude. That car was being propelled by rockets and was powerful enough to blow through the wall of this house without getting so much as a dent. You are several different levels of dead right now. And if by some miracle you aren't, you definitely aren't in a position to be getting up immediately like nothing happened. Oh no, he's fine, don't worry about it. What? What is going on right now? I don't even know what's happening anymore. And as for you people, why are you not trying to fight back? Dash, listen to me, you little cactus prick. You are a speedster. How about you try dashing around the room to try to grab or at least damage the goggles, or if not that, then maybe have them try to sweep the legs to knock them to their feet? Or if that's all too risky for you, then how about you just try to disorient them? What about using Jack Jack's laser eyes you people apparently have a perfect grasp of? Or how about using those insanely powerful force blades we saw Violet using at the beginning of the movie? Oh, sorry, did you want me to forget about those? Yeah, that ain't gonna happen. No matter how hard you try to do a free guy and introduce massive game-changing stakes like this, like the portal gun in that movie, only to pretend they don't exist later, it's not gonna work. Nice try. But while we're talking about portals, remember Void? Yeah, she can use portals. So here's a wild idea. Instead of making Dash run towards himself like he's playing Portal, how about you use your powers to portal the car out of the room? The instant that car blasted through the wall, removing that from the playing field should be your absolute top priority because as long as it's there, the kids and Frozone can use it to escape. So just create a massive portal beneath the car and drop it off the cliff nearby. Oh, what's that? You don't think she can make a portal large enough to fit the car? Well, I seriously doubt that considering there doesn't seem to be a limit on how
how big her portals can get, but fine. Let's assume that there is a limit on the size of her portals. In that case, simply put a portal beneath one of the tires, let it fall through, and then close it to puncture the tire in two. You can even do that on all four tires. But nope! Not only does Void not do this, none of the knockoffs seem to care even a little bit about the car. They all get tunnel vision trying to attack Frozone, and not a single one of them gives even half a damn about the vehicle they could use to escape. Destroy the tires! Short-circuited systems! Bomb on to keep them away! Something! Anything at this point! Can you at least pretend to be halfway competent at this? Oh, and by the way, this is all giving the incredibly generous assumption that there's some sort of limitation on the range of Void's portals in terms of what the distance between them can be. Because if there was no range limit, then this should have been over before it even started. The second Void opened up the door, she should have just put a portal beneath Dash and Violet's feet to drop them into the DevTech ship. But even if we give the generous assumption that the range limit does exist, which is highly questionable as we will soon see, that doesn't fix the problem because you can still do all the things I just suggested regarding dealing with the car. You could also drop them into the pool outside, or onto the roof of the house where they can't easily get down but the Owlman would have the height advantage. Or you know what? Screw it. How about you just fucking juggle them in the air like the mug from earlier? There are so many ways you can use your portals to end this battle in a matter of seconds but Void doesn't take advantage of any of them. Because you guys just wanted to have a superhero who can make portals because aren't portals so cool, guys? And you didn't stop to think for even a second how this was going to impact the story. And once again with the car, what are you idiots doing? Every single one of these people is ganging up on Frozen as if he's their number one priority when the kids are literally in a car right now, about five seconds away from escaping. Destroy the tires! Vomit on them, zap them, cut them in half with a portal. You got any toys lying around? I hear they're pretty effective at cutting tires. Stop messing around with Frozen, you have bigger issues right now! So then they finally get a hold of Frozen and shove the glasses onto his face and it immediately converts him to the bad guy's team. How? How does this work? He was already wearing a mask that covers his eyes. Obviously it must be slightly translucent, otherwise he wouldn't have ever been able to see anything during battle, but surely that must impact how easily he's able to be subdued by the goggles, right? Wrong! Ah! Okay, well at least now that they have a superhero with brain cells on their team, surely he'll actually aim for the tires to stop them from- Nope! Even Frozone doesn't aim for the goddamn tires! What happened to the Frozone from the beginning of the movie who was consciously choosing to aim for the treads of the tunneler to slow it down? Where did he go? Did you all take stupid pills this morning? What is wrong with all of you? Don't aim for the windshield, freeze the tires to stop them dead in their tracks! Do the goggles also lower your IQ levels or something stupid like that? Or is the defense supposed to be that because they're all run through Evelyn's command center, their capabilities are limited by her intelligence? In that case, I not only would reiterate my questions from earlier as to how this mind control works, but would also simply shift the criticism from the heroes are acting like idiots to the villain is an idiot, and neither of those realities are optimal, so no matter whose intelligence you think is the cause of these issues doesn't really matter, and I'm gonna keep calling out the moronic behavior as we go. For instance, why don't you guys chase after the car once it leaves? Just because they're in a rocket car doesn't mean you can't keep up with it. Frozen was able to skate fast enough to almost outrun the Omnidroid, Owlman can literally fly and Void has fucking PORTALS! LITERAL PORTALS! What is stopping you people from keeping up the pursuit? Incredible. Pull over. Look, I don't- WHAT?! The car stopped! It's a free kill! Free win! It's free real estate! You're playing on easy mode now! They've served themselves up on a silver platter! If you had kept chasing them, you could have easily captured them by now! Also, why would you think for even a second it was a good idea to stop while you were being chased by another team of superheroes? Even if you thought, oh, we're well, probably in the clear now, why would you want to take that chance? What is happening in this movie anymore? Who wrote this garbage? What were you people thinking? Oh, but fear not, because we're knee-deep in the climax now and the insanity has only just begun. Violet is big sad because their parents and Lucius got themselves screen slaves so they're wondering what they should do. Then Jack-Jack bends the fabric of reality because why the fuck not at this point and this is apparently enough to motivate them to chase after the dev tech ship to go rescue their parents. I, I don't- I- sure, let's just roll with it at this point. Jack-Jack can bend reality to his will now. What's one more broken ability to add to the pile? Can we get him a socks toy when he's old enough? I think they'd get along real nicely. We got Frozone. Uh, how are you able to talk to Evelyn right now when you're in screen slaver mode? Everybody else that was under her control was actually brain dead until the goggles were removed. Only able to speak if Evelyn gave them commands to do so. What's different about you? I don't understand the rules of this mind control! <sighs> okay, 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 it's okay, it's fine, it's okay, we're good. So the kids arrive at DevTech, but alas, they are too late as the boat has already set sail, so it seems that our heroes have lost. <laughs> How 
wonderfully convenient that you accidentally managed to activate the very mode you needed to activate by accidentally triggering the car's voice commands. This movie is such a joke. Also, for as much of a nitpick as it may be for me to point this out, it annoys me more than it probably should that they apparently forgot the order of abilities on the style. So then our heroes take off at a speed of sound as they charge across the water to catch up to the boat while Michael Giacchino's score continues to go harder than it ever has before, and god damn it, I wish your name was attached to a film that wasn't steaming hot garbage. So then, then, the kids discover a fatal flaw in their plan, being that they don't have a way to get from the car up onto the deck of the ship, but Dash once again accidentally finds a solution by saying, What if the Incredibile has ejector seats? And so it automatically selects the eject mode and they launch themselves onto the ship? Really? Again! Again! You pulled this same stupid trick twice in the span of a minute of screen time. Wait, what? What are you doing there? How did you people get back onto the boat before the kids got here? The kids arrived to the dock long after the boat had left, and it was already a pretty good distance out into the ocean, meaning that you would have also had to get back onto the boat long before they got there, and I'm sorry, but I just don't see how that's possible. Unless you mean to tell me that they used Void's portals to get back onto the boat, in which case any argument you could have previously made for a limit on the range of her abilities just flew right out the window. Speaking of flying, no, they could not have used the Owlman to fly them all here because there's no way he could have carried all of them here mid-flight. At least not without doing it over the course of multiple trips, which would definitely take up too much time. And if they had some sort of helicopter standing by, then that just gives them even less of an excuse for not chasing after the kids in the Incredibile. None of this makes any sense at all. And I'm sorry, did nobody hear that? Nobody heard the kids launch themselves up or the sound of them whooshing past or the sound of the force field or the sound of the tumbling onto the deck of the ship? None of you? That's a lot of years doing nothing. Oh, whatever. Moving on. So after successfully sneaking on board the boat, Violet says that they need to find their parents and so she decides to leave Dash and Jack Jack behind while she goes out to search for them all by herself. Violet, you numbskull. Why would you ever choose to leave these two behind? You three need to stick together no matter what right now. You are deep in enemy territory, unarmed and outnumbered. You should not be moving around the deck by yourself because even with your invisibility powers, there are still ways in which you can be detected. Your footsteps still make sounds and leave dents in the carpet. And you definitely don't want to leave the two youngest kids alone when anybody could wander into this room whenever they want to. And if your concern is over Jack-Jack making noise and blowing your cover, there's a very easy solution to that problem, that being to simply cover his mouth until he stops talking. And if you absolutely need to send one of you out to do recon to try to find your parents while one looks after Jack-Jack, then you should not be the one to do it. Dash should be. Why? Because he's a speedster. Nobody could ever possibly capture him because he can take one step and be on the other side of the boat in half a second. Unless you're gonna tell me that actually he can still be caught because Violet can use her portals to trap him, in which case I would simply tell you that Violet is no less susceptible to her portals than he is. On top of that, because he can move so fast, he'll be able to scout the ship in significantly less time than you'd be able to. Sending Violet out to be the one to do recon makes absolutely no tactical sense whatsoever. And you wanna know something interesting? The LEGO game did exactly what what I am proposing here. We need to be stealthy. Cash, can you scout the ship without being seen? Uh-huh. <laughs> The fucking Lego video game is doing a better job at writing this story than you are right now. That is how pathetic your script is. But also, you don't even really need to send only one of you out to find your parents. Do you remember at the end of the first movie where you learned to put your skills together and roll through the jungle as an unstoppable ball of destruction? This strat is so OP it can literally tear through flying blade saucers as if it's rolling over a piece of gum. Why are you not using this? Spoiler alert, they not only haven't used it throughout this entire movie thus far, despite the fact that it would have been really helpful for escaping that house battle quickly, but they also won't be using it ever again beyond this point. Combine Dash's speed with your force fields and nobody on this boat is gonna be able to come anywhere near you. And hey, once again, the LEGO game let you do this! You're losing to the LEGO game! And so naturally, the second after Violet leaves, Jack-Jack immediately starts crying and then teleports himself into the other dimension. Fantastic! Well, at least you have a remote control you can use to track him. You are gonna use that remote, right? Right? You aren't just gonna completely forget you have that because Dash, like everyone else in this movie, is a moron, right? No, of course he is. God damn it. Ow. Meanwhile, Violet's stealth mission goes horribly awry because she, too, is incompetent and accidentally trips over the potted plant, thus allowing Void to follow the trail of dirt and track her down. Which doesn't make any sense at all because that trail of dirt goes cold extremely quickly. You may have a general idea of the direction she went, but there's no way you'd be able to pinpoint her exact location and then subsequently portal in front of her to cut her off. <laughs> Ah! <laughs> 
Alright then, I guess you somehow are able to track her down to this exact room. Void immediately uses her portals to pull Violet close to her, which is great! Good job, you finally used your portals in a non-idiotic way for the first time in forever. Now keep doing it! Do it again! Do it again! No, what? No, no, no! What are you doing? Don't slowly walk toward her, you neon baboon! Keep using your portals! Trap her in an infinite portal loop like you did to Dash earlier! Only make this one vertical instead of horizontal so you can lock her in place until you get close enough to screen slave her! Or, since you clearly don't have to make both of your portals at the same time, yet one will still work without the other, how about you trap her in whatever space between spaces things go when moving through your portals, and wait to make the other portal until you're ready to screen slave her! Shambling towards her is just gonna give her the time to- Exactly! God! Every time the characters do something even moderately intelligent, it's immediately undercut with a train of stupidity right around the corner. Oh my god, so you do still remember that you have fourth ways you can use. I was honestly starting to think that I imagined them considering the fact that you never use them between then and now, even when doing so would have been extremely helpful. So then Violet victoriously shoves Void over the railing and onto the floor below, and then she runs away?! You fucking muppet! Take off her goggles! She's unconscious! You are perfectly aware of the fact that these goggles are the things that are controlling everybody, yet you just leave her down there? Why would you do that? How dense can you be? Do you know how valuable it is to have someone on your team with the ability to generate portals seemingly anywhere at any size any number of times? What are you doing? Take off the goggles! Why is everybody in this film so stupid? Oh, but then, as if you didn't already hate Violet enough for being an idiot, now we get a taste of how she treats her brother. Where's Jack-Jack? Mm. You lost him? I gave you one thing to do! Hey! Dumb fuck. You are dealing with a baby that can literally teleport between dimensions anytime he wants to. That's not just one thing to do. That is a monumental task you left him to tackle all by himself without his approval. You don't have any right to be chewing him out over this whatsoever. The tracker! Use the tracker! Oh, brilliant! Now you remember that you have a tracking remote in your backpack. Gee, if only you remember this thing existed literally two minutes ago. But of course, if we did that, then Violet wouldn't have been able to be an ass to dash. And if we we wouldn't want to miss out on that now, would we? So Dash and Violet follow Jack-Jack upstairs into the kitchen only to discover he's burst into flames! They extinguish him, but oh no! <laughs> the baby screamed out right as the element happened to be nearby and so he begins charging down the hall to investigate the source of the noise only instead of flying down there because he's an owl, he follows in Void's footsteps and slowly shuffles down the hall thus allowing the kids the time they need to climb up into the ventilation and hide. Now you know what, I'm still gonna call bullshit. They had less than five seconds to somehow climb all the way up to this vent and then cram everybody inside. Or in other words, no, that did not happen. There's nothing anywhere near the vent they could have climbed onto so how in the world could they have possibly gotten up there? And how exactly is this more advantageous than blocking the door with a force field or just using your force plates to attack the owl man? Because I feel like cramming yourself into this enclosed space makes it really easy for someone to be able to- Yep, that's what happens when you do stupid things like this. And he only knows they're hiding up there because Jack-Jack screams out again. Why does he do this, you may ask? Well, that's because Violet's big brain plan to keep him quiet is to give him the expensive remote control? Is it okay to give him that? I wasn't hearing any better ideas. Eh? That doesn't prevent him from talking. If anything, it might actually make him even more talkative because he'll get excited over the cool new features of the remote, which is exactly what happens. How about you just cover his mouth like you do seconds later anyway, like normal people, you rusted spoons? Oh, and by the way, the Crusher Man is actively trying to crush them to death. That is the end game of squeezing the vents together. They die, painfully. But remember, everyone, they want to bring in these kids alive. Uh-huh, sure thing, movie. Whatever you say. You know what? This scene isn't bad enough yet. What if we topped it off by giving giving Jack-Jack another new ability. <laughs> He can make himself into a giant baby as well? What are we at now, like 17 superpowers? This is getting ridiculous. And then Jack-Jack proceeds to try to tap the screen, but because he's big and strong now, ends up breaking the iPad instead. This is why you don't give the stupid little baby the extremely expensive and valuable remote. Because toddlers break things. Especially when they apparently have the ability to turn themselves into giant babies. Why did you even bother introducing the stupid thing? It didn't matter at all to the story. They used it once to track Jack-Jack to the kitchen area and then never again. The whole reason Edna made made this thing was so that you had the ability to control Jack-Jack, yet you made absolutely no use of it whatsoever outside of this one time and then you broke it! What was the goddamn point? And once again, you have now incapacitated three different knockoff superheroes. The Crusher, the Owlman, and Void have all been knocked out. All of them are primed and ready for goggles removal, so surely they're going to take advantage of this opportunity, right? WRONG! They run away again! You stupid piles of sawdust! You know what these goggles do! You talked 
talked about it in the car right here. Why are you leaving these very dangerous knockoff superheroes still under the control of a screen slaver? <sighs> Okay, moving on! Jack-Jack charged us through a series of walls and dashed and violently gave pursuit with an admittedly clever use of her force field technology. First time for everything, I suppose. Meanwhile, the world leaders all signed the document to officially legalize supers again, and as they all gather together for a group photo, suddenly the wall turns into another screen to hypnotize the ambassadors and their respective random superheroes. Apparently. Don't question it. The wall's a screen. It just is. Turn your brain off and enjoy our movie. Mr. Incredible, Last Girl, and Frozone say that they're sick of cleaning up humanity's messes and that they don't serve people anymore, and warn that only the fittest will survive. Then Elastigirl breaks the camera and the three mind-controlled superheroes head into the bridge of the ship, let the crew call for help by saying the supers have taken the bridge, and then probably kills all three of them violently, yeets the command center out the window, steers the boat towards the city, and subsequently destroy the controls. Question, why is this the plan? If your goal is to make people hate superheroes, then why wouldn't you just have all three of them directly murder the people in the signing room? It's not like they're gonna be able to fight back, they're all hypnotized right now. Alright! Because if they didn't create a situation with a ticking clock, then there wouldn't be a chance for the heroes to save the day and the movie would be over! Silly me! What Whatever was I thinking? It is at this very moment that Jack-Jack, Dash, and Violet arrive in the control room having finally found their parents, only to be immediately attacked by them after which we get an ominous shot looking up at the three heroes ready to fight their children without their knowledge or volition. You have no idea how excited I was for the battle that was about to ensue when I saw this for the first time. Most of the movie had spectacularly failed to engage me on my first viewing, and by this point, I was just about ready for this horrific roller coaster ride to end. But for a brief moment, I felt genuine hype. The kids facing off against their parents in a superhero battle. The potential for a fight scene like this was limitless, even more so than Bob vs. Elastigirl from earlier. Dash and Violet would have to find a way to outwit adults who are far stronger and more experienced than they are without anybody else to help them out. I suddenly sat all the way forward in my chair, ready for the most epic fight scene of the movie. If I wasn't gonna get to watch the Incredibles fight together, I was at least gonna get to watch them battle each other and see the kids prove to their parents, again, that they were more than capable of handling themselves in combat and discover all the super creative ways that they would use their unique Unique powers too. Yeah, yeah, no! Put him down! <gasps> you fuckers! Again! You did it again! You did it again! You worthless potatoes! You presented me another situation that could have been an epic fight scene, and then she went it all because you just had the stupid goddamn baby save the day again. He not only levitates directly towards his mom, but he then proceeds to telekinetically lift the goggles off her face. Oh, but that's okay, because at least we're gonna get to see an epic battle where Alaska has to 1v2 Mr. Incredible and Frozone. Or maybe she can even work together with her kids to fight them. Once again, at least the LEGO game gave us a kids versus parents fight scene as the final boss, so surely at least we're gonna get that, right? Nope! Once again, they waste it, because her fight against these two lasts a collective three seconds before she effortlessly defeats them both almost immediately. I could have blinked and missed the whole battle. Can I please get even a hint of the Incredibles engaging in well-choreographed combat together without you fumbling the ball with this lobotomy of a script like you always do? And why didn't Evelyn command them to do anything about Jack-Jack? The second she saw and acknowledged that he was a super baby, she should have done something immediately. As has been previously established, you clearly have no compunctions about trying to kill these children, so what are you doing? Did you just go brain dead for a bit? What is wrong with you? Say something! No, 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 put him down! Oh, what? Now you decide to do something? You waited until the absolute last possible minute to actually act upon the super baby that's threatening to undo your plan entirely? How could I be mad? I'm proud. You're what? What do you mean you're proud of them for coming to rescue you? What changed for you throughout this movie? Am I supposed to think you actually went on a character arc? Because that never happened. You opened up the movie by saying that the kids weren't old enough to make their own decisions, which was stupid, but that's when you believed. Then you had a whole bunch of fight scenes and didn't have any interactions with your kids between then and now, and now all of a sudden you're proud of them? And by the way, this little arc you want me to think you went on was just a blatant repeat of the lesson she already learned at the end of the first movie. Man, I can't wait for Incredibles 3 where we have another fucking dinner scene and once again and Helen says, Actually, you're young and immature and don't know what you're doing. And then we repeat the whole cycle over again. Then Helen tells the other family members that Evelyn is the one in control of the screen slaver. Do you like how she's only able to confidently say that because Evelyn woke her up with the express purpose of monologuing to her like an idiot? It's almost as if doing that was a really stupid idea or something like that. Speaking of stupid ideas, Helen changes into her Incredibles uniform? Why? Why is that your priority right now? You are careening towards the mainland at dangerously high speeds and Evelyn is still out and about ready to send the other mind-controlled heroes after you 
you at any given moment, and you're worried about what suit you're wearing? What is this, the Winter Soldier? You have bigger issues to worry about right now. And if you're really worried about that little cut you got, I promise you, you will survive. It won't be the end of the world. Don't waste time changing your entire goddamn outfit. Okay, but you know what? It's fine. We're about to get the moment we've all been waiting for. After a whole movie's worth of nothingness and character assassination, we're finally gonna get to see the Incredibles all fight together as a family when the knockoff superheroes come through the portal. You had like six strikes already, but hey, I'm feeling generous today. Maybe this time you'll actually give us a competent fight scene. Maybe? Maybe just maybe? No! Not even slightly. Bob gets knocked down immediately and the only people here actually working together are Dash, Violet, and Jack-Jack. Which is something, I'll give it that, at least some of the family members are collaborating in this fight. It's better than nothing, but it's nowhere near enough to make up for everything else you've wasted throughout this film so far. And besides, this isn't even a battle that we should have had to build up to in the first place. That's what the first movie was for. That movie exists to slowly work toward bringing the Incredibles together to fight as a family. You don't get to swell the music and pretend like like this is some big moment worth celebrating when it's only because of the retconning decisions that you made in this movie that people would have any reason at all to be excited by this. Anyway, Owl Man flies into the bridge to drop off Vomit Man to try to kill Violet, but Frozen pushes back against it and frees him from mind control, meaning that he, Zap Man, and Void are now free, but then, shock. Horror! Owl Man grabs Dash and flies him out the window of the boat, and so he is lost forever, but fear not, for Violet grabs Jack-Jack and activates laser eye mode to shoot down the Owl Man so he can't fly away with Dash. Yeah, let's have a crap shoot with deadly lasers directly at your little brother who's extremely far away from you when you have absolutely no experience in trying to aim him and could very easily have struck Dash by mistake. What an ingenious idea. Hey, remember this scene from the first film? You have to stop him! Throw something! I can't! I might hit Jack-Jack! You clearly used to be concerned about these types of things. Oops. I guess we kind of forgot about that too, huh? And man, how lucky is it that Owlman didn't fly in literally any other direction so Violet had a clear shot at him and so that there was solid ground for him to actually drop Dash off on. Because if he flew him out over the ocean, you'd have been completely screwed. How about instead you go over to Void and tell her to portal him back into the room? Anyway, Dash makes the Owlman spin his head around and then he knocks his lights out, bringing them to a grand total of four heroes saved, and then Bob gets his ass handed to him on a silver platter because he sucks now, but Helen comes to save the day, and so five of the six superheroes have now been freed, and because of that, Evelyn promptly gives up on trying to incapacitate them and instead decides to run away with Winston by taking the emergency backup escape jet. I'm sorry, isn't that going to look immensely suspicious, or at the very least morally questionable, that you consciously chose to fly away from the boat destined to crash into the city without doing anything to help the other people? That the two people who own this ship are also going to be the only two people to have survived this attack? Yeah, I'm sure that won't raise any eyebrows at all. This whole plan is so stupid. Nobody would have ever fallen for this. Nobody with a brain would have watched this broadcast, seen that the hero's dialogue was clearly scripted and stinted, and that they were wearing goggles that were extremely reminiscent of the screen slaver, and then came to the conclusion of, oh my goodness, I guess the heroes were evil all along, rather than saying, oh my goodness, the heroes have been mind controlled, and you choosing to run away does not help matters at all because it will look like you consciously chose to let them all die. God, nothing about you or your motivations makes even the slightest bit of sense. Winston jumps off the jet because he refuses to escape as a coward, and now it's up to the Incredibles to stop Evelyn from escaping and to stop the boat from crashing into the city. Everybody except the last girl sits on the sidelines and just tells her to go stop Evelyn because they got a hold of the script and finally figured out that this movie was never actually about them and she's clearly the star of the show. Finish your mission. <laughs> I can't just go! What about the kids? Jack-Jack! Who's gonna- Oh my god, shut the hell up, you glorified spaghetti creature! What do you think Bob has been doing the entire time you were away? Taking care of the kids! Which you apparently still don't think he can do if that was your immediate reaction to being told to leave again. You didn't learn anything throughout this movie. Bob concluded in the first film that they were stronger together and he didn't have to take on the whole world alone, and that he needed to commit to becoming a better father than he had been for 15 years. You never learned anything like that. You never faced any kind of personal obstacles or development as evidenced by your continued lack of faith in everybody else here. In fact, you've actually regressed as you've become more of an insufferable asshat and you've become less competent than you used to be. Whatever, I just want this movie to be over with already. Bob runs to try to shut down the engines while Frozen works to slow the ship from the outside with his ice powers, but along the way he crosses paths with the sixth and final knockoff superhero who crushes all the pipes out from the walls to block his path and then tries to crush Bob against the wall. But in the end, Bob still emerges victorious by launching one of the pipes in his head to knock off the goggles. I feel like that should probably do something else to him. Like, I don't know, maybe kill him? Elastigirl and Void race up the stairs to try to stop the jet from taking off, but they're too late, so now we get to see Void use her portal powers once again to save the day. Let's see if she's any smarter with them now that she's goggles free. She places her first portal above the jet for Elastigirl to jump through, which is a great first step. Unfortunately, she forgot that planes move and didn't take that into account when placing it, so she flies right past the jet and apparently doesn't think to stretch out her arms to try to grab a hold of it. But fear not, for it's time for Take 2, New and Improved Edition, where she actually manages to get her to land on top of the jet. She probably sustained several major body injuries after falling with that much velocity, but it's fine, at least she made it onto the top of the- Nope, she 
she still falls off because even though she actually tries to stretch her arm out this time, she still can't reach far enough to grab hold of anything, which I do not buy at all considering what's about to happen in five seconds and what we saw you do at the end of the first movie to get them back to the mainland. But it's fine. Third time's the charm after all. <laughs> Ooh, yikes. So, that's a concussion at the very least, but I'm gonna go ahead and say you should probably be dead. Flying through these portals isn't gonna stall your velocity at all, and at the rate you're falling from the sky, this should hurt a lot more than the movie wants you to think it does. And what was even the thought process here? What was the intended effect of launching her upward directly below the plane if it wasn't to kill her by splatting her against it? So now we come to Void's fourth and final portal, and Elastigirl is finally able to extend her arm way further than she just did a moment ago to be able to grab hold of something and get her inside the plane. Wait, what? Inside the plane? You put a portal inside the goddamn plane? That's not- How did you- Planes move! Planes move. Planes are not stationary objects. If you place a portal inside that plane, and Elastigo gets through it, she might end up warping herself inside the wall, and you might end up cutting a massive hole in the plane when you close that portal. And if you can somehow make the portal move in tandem with the plane, then why the hell was that not the first thing you tried to do? This is why you don't give a character the freedom to place portals anywhere they want. That's a guaranteed way to break your story in half every time they use them, or don't use them depending on the circumstances. Oh, and now we get to this scene. This stupid fucking scene. <laughs> hey, you did this. Can you undo it? No. To uncrush is silly. Why uncrush? To get into the engine. Oh, forget it. We don't have enough time. Incredible suit pissed me off a whole lot throughout its entire runtime, but if I had to pick a single moment that made me want to stand up and throw something at the screen, it would be this one. Forget it. We don't have enough time. What if I said to untouch someone? What do you do? This is some of the all-time stupidest, most headache-inducing dialogue I've ever heard. You absolutely can uncrush. It makes absolutely no sense that you wouldn't be able to do that. Uncrushing literally just means crushing in the opposite direction. If you can crush pipes to move this way, you can absolutely crush them to move that way and vice versa. Or even if we accept the stupid well, uncrush is silly. Why uncrush? nonsense, that, fine. Then just crush the pipes even further together to compress them enough to allow you to reach the engine room by sneaking along the sides. Also, are you really trying to tell me that Mr. Incredible seriously is not strong enough to be able to move these pipes apart when he was literally bench pressing a train in the last movie? Or when he was able to throw someone through four different walls before he underwent his bodybuilder training? Or when he uprooted the tree with his bare hands? Or pulled a train all by himself? Or knocked out the Omnidroid with one punch once again before his training? He could do all this crazy stuff, but some pipes in a hallway are enough to outmatch Mr. Incredible's strength. That is so stupid to think about. You can't just punch through the pipes, or punch through the wall on either side of them, or punch down into the engine room from the floor above. You can't use this little twit to vomit his way through, or get Dash and Violet to use their rolling ball trick from the first movie to roll through, or have Jack-Jack use his laser eyes to cut through, or have him turn into a giant baby, or, here's a thought, how about you have Void use her fucking portals to teleport you into the engine room? Does anybody in this movie have a brain? Did Common Sense go on vacation with Dicker? There are so many ways you could get into that room and shut down the engines, but you choose to take advantage of none of them because you're all idiots. And by the way, this is only an obstacle we have to deal with because for some reason, the Crusher guy wasn't sent into the bridge along with literally every other knockoff hero in the world so he could be here to block Bob's path to the engine room. Sure is convenient Evelyn didn't just send him in with everyone else, otherwise this boat would have been stopped already. So because everybody kind of forgot about literally everything they can do with superheroes, they decided that the only logical course of action is to manually destroy one of the foils and then manually turn the rudder, which is underwater, in order to steer the ship away from the city to try to slow its momentum in time. Wow, that sounds like a ridiculously overcomplicated and dangerous plan. If only there were a million other significantly easier ways you could have resolved this conflict already. Be a shame if that were the case, especially if this scene were shot in such a way that Void was deliberately kept off screen so you don't think about the fact that you have an infinite portal machine right next to you and nobody thinks to go over to ask you for help, nor does she come over to volunteer her help. God, this movie is so bad. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Peak Cringe. My shields are probably better protection than the ship. I should stay here with Jack-Jack. That's my girl. It, is this a payoff? Is that what you were doing here? Was that supposed to be her arc, learning to stay behind and watch Jack-Jack? Because this is just about the most over-the-top and unnecessarily dramatic thing in the entire movie. It already made the most logical sense for you to hold on to Jack-Jack. Bob didn't have a hold of him and was already well on his way to climbing down the ladder. You and Dash already had the baby. You didn't need to stop to tell him this. Especially not when you were getting dangerously close to crashing into the city and every second counts right now. But also, did you already forget what happened literally 10 minutes 
minutes ago when you carelessly tried to shove him off on the dash? What the hell changed? Why do we keep skipping the arc part of character arcs? This would have made much more sense as a moment of growth for Bob to have. You'd obviously have to change some things about the scene to make it make sense plot-wise, but character-wise, considering how much this film has butchered him by reverting him back to the state of craving the spotlight again, imagine how much more meaningful it would have been if he was the one to say, No, you kids go. You're ready for this. I need to stay back here and watch Jack-Jack. Do I have to do all the work for you, movie? Also, also, Violet has apparently decided that watching after Jack-Jack inherently means that she can't do literally anything else for the rest of the climax, which is really, really stupid because don't you think those force blades she kept using would be pretty effective at helping to destroy the foil of a ship considering how devastating they were earlier in the movie? Oh, and do you want to hear what Dash's big contribution to the final battle is? It's to push another button, because of course it is! Hey, you want to know what would make a lot more sense for him to do? How about you have him take advantage of his ability to run on water and make him run to the shoreline to keep the crowds away in case the plan fails and they do crash? Not only would that be a logical thing for him to do, but it would tie in perfectly to the beginning of the movie when he was stuck with crowd control when he really wanted to leap into the action. But nah, we can't have that. That makes too much sense. We don't do setups and payoffs anymore. Those are reserved for good movies like The Incredibles. Why would we want to have something come full circle here? That'd just be silly! But that's not the worst misuse of power because look at what Frozen's doing outside the ship. He's firing his ice blast in short control bursts. What are you doing? You should be shooting out continuous streams of ice to try to break the foils. You did that earlier. Minutes ago, you were shooting continuous streams to try to slow down the ship. Just do that again. You aren't going to get anywhere by firing out these short little spurts. Can even a single one of you actually use your superpowers in a non-moronic way? Please? Even just one time? Now while all that is going on, Elastigirl tries to make her way toward Evelyn to stop her, but she keeps doing Star Fox barrel rolls with a jet to toss her all over the place and eventually reaches an altitude so high that she starts to run low on oxygen. Not even a little smidgy widgy. What are you doing? What is wrong with you? What happened to all of you between movies? Did the tunneler explosion give you all brain damage? Are you not going to do anything to try to stop her? And in case you say, well, duh, she's suffering from hypoxia, dude. Ah, hypoxia. When you don't have enough oxygen, things seem really silly. Well, to that, I say no. That excuse ain't gonna fly because she clearly still has the presence of mind to try to stop Evelyn because as soon as she sees the flare gun on the floor, her eyes light up with a moment of realization and she fires it directly at Evelyn to knock her out of the planet then finally grabs the oxygen mask to- Wait a minute, there was just a convenient plot flare gun lying on the ground right next to you? Man, you guys must have really channeled the power of Nagito for this movie. How lucky that when Evelyn was having her Star Fox adventures, you happened to slam right into the case with the flare gun to not only knock it off the wall, but also open it up so that the flare gun would fall right next to where you needed it. Man, the luck just keeps on coming. Also, I guess Evelyn was sucked out of the plane, but Elastigirl's doing just fine. Sure. Whatever. Back on the ship now. Winston breaks a single panel on the wall screen and apparently that's enough to shut down the entire projection. I, I guess that's just how that works. There's no centralized control panel you need to interact with. Breaking one of the screens is enough to stop the entire thing. Sure. Fine. Whatever. My patience with this movie is growing increasingly thin. Winston orders all the supers to protect their ambassadors as they make a beeline for the back of the ship and as Bob still struggles to turn the rudder, Elastigirl launches herself out of the plane and grabs a hold of Evelyn. Hooray! She has her safely within her grasp, so now would be a great time for Void to put a portal beneath him in order to... Void. Void. Hey, Void. Void. What are you What are you doing? Void. What are you doing? Use your portals to get them back safely onto the boat. Stop standing around like a narcoleptic turkey. If you don't act soon, then Evelyn might just- <laughs> Exactly! Nobody ever thinks in this movie- <sighs> Okay, it's fine, it's fine. We're almost there. Bob successfully manages to turn the rudder after possibly breaking the world record for underwater breath holding, and so Dash pushes one last button to yank Bob back up from underwater. Helen catches up to Evelyn and grabs hold of her just in time for Void to make her portal to get them back onto the boat, and then they all die. Oh wait, no they don't, because this movie doesn't understand how velocity works. The brief amount of time during which Helen's chute was activated would absolutely not be enough to slow your velocity so you wouldn't be splattered to pieces. Of course, if you had actually opened up your portal when you were supposed to, we wouldn't even be having this problem, now would we, Void? And so, for the final act, Frozone miraculously manages to break off the foil at the absolute last possible second. He would have broken it a long time ago if he wasn't a complete idiot with how he used his ice powers, but who even cares at this point? The Incredibles, Frozone, and Void managed to stop the ship just in time before it crashes into the city, but you're never gonna get me to believe that nobody died here. Look at all those cars on the street. There's no way all of them could have possibly gotten out of the way in time. Gee, if only you had someone with the ability to run on water, 
Florida that could have been on crowd control duty to keep them all safe. But thankfully, that brings the climax of this movie to a close, and what an absolutely insane string of stupidity. That was almost a full hour of non-stop idiotic character decisions and action scenes. Then there's this laughable shot of all the superheroes who are on board the ship standing triumphantly celebrating their victory. Like, excuse me, what the fuck? What do you all think you're doing up there? Over half the people in this frame did approximately jack shit to stop this boat from crashing. You're not cool because you can fly. I don't even know who any of you are. You don't get to take the credit for something you didn't even have a minuscule part in accomplishing. Get out of the frame! Okay, so then Helen apologizes to Winston, warning him that she'll go to prison and- Well, I'm sorry she's rich and will probably get no more than a slap on the wrist. Stop it. Stop doing that. I'm so sick of you trying to pull this card. Yes, there is validity in what you are saying that oftentimes people in positions of power or wealth are able to evade serious punishment for their horrific actions. And once again, there are countless interesting stories you can tell surrounding that concept as has been the case for every other half-assed message you awkwardly shoved into the script. But you cannot just haphazardly throw lines like that into your movie if you aren't going to do anything to actually develop them, which Incredible Sue definitely does not do. Hold on, you're walking away? How are you walking away from this? Evelyn was operating as the screen they were directly under your nose, and this whole incident happened on your hydrofoil. How are you not being brought up for questioning right now? What the hell is happening? I saw what you did back there. That was incredible. I mean, no pun intended. Oh my god, just kill me now. That was so bad. All right, that's it. We've hit the speed run point. The point where I get sick of dealing with the movie's idiocy and just race to the end. Let's go. Winston drops his required dose of sequel bait, Lee from The Walking Dead. Yes, yeah, seriously, the judge's voice with the guy who voices Lee. Who knew? Makes superheroes legal, despite that having already been the implied conclusion from the first movie, and Violet asks Tony out on a date, to which he says, Yes, thus demonstrating the pointlessness of her entire conflict throughout the story. And so the whole family picks Tony up because I guess Bob and Helena want to maximize embarrassment for their daughter on her first date. And also because we wouldn't be able to copy and paste the ending of the first film if we just had one parent pick them up. Because yes, like so many other things, we close out the sequel the same way we closed out the first movie, except, once again, made it significantly worse because not only do you cut Michael Giacchino's phenomenal musical score short before it even gets to the best part, thus cheapening the impact of the moment. <laughs> Not only is this an incredibly suspicious thing to do, because Violet has to kick Tony out of the car in order to chase down the robbers, and if Tony has even half a brain, he's gonna have a hell of a lot of questions about where Violet disappeared to, especially if he connects the dots between the timing of the robbery and the timing of Violet running off for seemingly no reason, especially after all the other family members ominously looked at each other like they're all in some kind of cult. Can't wait for her to try to explain that shit when she gets back, if he's even still there. Like, genuinely, what would you think if you were Tony here? After all the interactions he's had with her in this movie, I feel like I might just feel the instinctive urge to run as far away as possible. I don't even know that I trust her to come back at all at this point. But on top of all that, this is just straight up lame compared to the first movie. That film had a perfect sense of escalation, starting with small, street-level crimes for the heroes to stop, before slowly scaling things up to ultimately fight the Omnidroid, and then close out with a tease of the Underminer, which is the biggest the stakes could ever get. This time around, we open too big with the very same Underminer, and then close out way too small with a robbery not too dissimilar from the one that opened the first movie that you definitely do not need Violet to stop. I feel like you could probably say, go enjoy your date, honey. We got this. But who cares about all that? We gotta recreate the original ending to milk that nostalgia, am I right, guys? But nevertheless, that finally brings us to the end of the long-awaited Incredibles 2 when the film closes out on the family's car, transforming into the newly revamped Incredible, and our heroes race towards the camera on their quest to stop a robbery. There's deja vu. Holy mother of supers, what a catastrophic disaster of a movie. What a shockingly drastic shift in quality between two entries in a film series. Word of advice, if you ever watch Incredibles 2, which you should never ever do as I've hopefully demonstrated throughout the series, but if you do, never do it back to back with the first Incredibles movie. Doing so is nothing but pain and suffering and you'll just be left wondering how you can screw up a sequel to such a brilliant film with an ending that just seems to be begging for a sequel. You'd think it would be a guaranteed improvement over the original when you have the same writing team, but this time you're technical presentation has extra room to breathe with technological advancements and a higher budget. And just like with Toy Story 4, it certainly made use of that additional budget, there's no denying that. Ready to hear a bunch of things you've heard a million times before? Visuals are an unquestionable improvement over the original, with a special shout out to Frozone's ice effects. That was honestly the thing to take me most by surprise when comparing this to this. The animation and visual fidelity are both so exquisite to the point where they're legit just straight up flexing on you with how the technology has improved so drastically in the 14 years since the first movie. And as far as the music is concerned, this might be a controversial 
controversial position to take, but I actually think Michael Giacchino's work on this movie is even stronger than it was the first time around. Whenever he tries to remake something from the first film, it sounds measurably worse. Wherever have I heard that before? I can't exactly put my finger on what it is that makes them sound worse, as musical analysis has never been my strong suit, but I think you'll be able to tell something's amiss by just listening to the glory days and consider yourselves undermined back to back. Or even just the in-credits ending credits too. Ignoring those, though, every single new track is immediately memorable and slaps harder than Edna with a newspaper. But none of that should be news to you. Mind-blowing visuals and an exceptional soundtrack are just the standard to be expected from Pixar most of the time, and it really blows to see such incredible work be completely wasted because everything else about this movie sucks so much ass, and the superficial elements are never enough to make up for them. Pretty graphics and orgasmic music are the icing, not the cake. They're the sizzle, not the steak. And without that foundation, they will all ring entirely hollow, especially since graphics are always going to age in due time, as evidenced by the original movie, which does not look particularly incredible in retrospect, but it looked amazing at the time. What hasn't aged a day is its phenomenal phenomenal script because a well-written story will always remain just as impactful as it always was for all of eternity. And the script for Incredibles 2 falls apart horrifically in all four main categories, those being plot, world building, themes, and characters. Plot-wise, as I've thoroughly demonstrated throughout the last almost four hours at this point, the specific mechanics that allow this story to happen range from being fundamentally broken or relying on an astronomical amount of contrivance. To briefly summarize the insane amount of garbage we've just had to endure, we have the entire B-plot with Violet's love life being kicked off because of the ridiculously contrived opening consisting of the Incredibles happening to run toward and stop in front of the car Tony just so happened to be hiding under instead of just running away like everybody else, as well as her just randomly deciding to throw her mask to the ground and then turn around at literally the worst time imaginable. We have the Underminer choosing the stupidest possible manner in which to go about robbing the bank as well as the very concept of him wanting to rob a bank at all being directly at odds with his speech from the first film. We have him teleporting around during his fight with Mr. Incredible. We have revelations the characters have gained remarkable new abilities that they appear to have complete mastery of. Of. We have contrived garbage such as the entire A-plot only happened because Winston happened to show up at the exact right moment to be able to chat with Frozen because I guess his immediate urge upon seeing the Underminer wasn't to run the other direction. It was to hang around town amidst all the chaos in case there was any need for a dose of plot convenience. Then we have things such as the mind-blowing stupidity of the house robbery where not only were the phones not placed into the safe room for unknown reasons, but their father decided that they were the best course of action to take despite allegedly knowing about the outlawing of superheroes thus leading to the creation of the screen slaver. We have characters getting Getting immensely lucky with train crashes not tipping them over the edge, or helicopters missing the chance to kill you by an absurdly slim margin, or being provided handy dandy flare guns and cars show up at the exact moment they need them to, raccoons not murdering Jack Jack when by all accounts he should have been extremely dead here, obviously evil layers that never drew any suspicion from anyone ever, Winston being allowed to keep a mask that absolutely should have gone into an evidence collection, thus allowing Elastigirl to get Screen Slave, Screen Slaver herself, for that matter, and her comically illogical plan, and just about anything and everything to do with Void's portal abilities in the entire climax from the moment the knockoff supers launch the attack in the Pars house to the moment the credits roll. I'm not going to relist every single breach and logical example of contrivance. You have the rest of the series for that. This is merely an abridged recap of just some of the greatest hits of stupidity you can find in this movie. And in case there's still anybody out there that wants to try to do a repeat of my Toy Story 4 series by saying that, oh come on man, you are so clearly biased against this movie. The original Incredibles movie also had writing problems. If you want to try to make this counter argument, I will tell you the exact same thing I told people who are me of that in that series. Yes, The Incredibles is not a flawless movie, and I have never claimed otherwise. In fact, to extend an olive branch, I'll even list specific examples that I noticed in my most recent viewing of the writing problems in the first movie that really annoyed me. Had Bob and Lucius crashed through the building in the other direction and triggered the alarm there, they may not have gotten as unlucky as they did by landing in a jewelry store, but also may not have gotten as lucky as they did by landing directly next to a water cooler Frozen can use to freeze the police officers. In fact, there are several instances of convenience or lack thereof in this movie. Things like Mirage calling Bob with another cryptic assignment at the exact moment that Helen happens to find the stray hair on his jacket, or Mirage coming through the lava wall at the perfect moment for Bob to be able to sneak through, or Dash landing on the conveniently located flying sauce in order to survive, or, and this one really annoys me, Helen screwing over her husband by activating the homing signal at literally the worst time imaginable. Speaking of which, is there any good reason for the signal to actually erratically flash and beep like this? Does this not seem like a massive design oversight specifically for situations like this? In order to activate the homing signal, you need to have the remote, but so long as you have the remote, then you can just use that to find Bob. You shouldn't need to listen out for him like it's a game of Wii Party Hide and Hunt. And if I have to pick a single moment in The Incredibles that frustrates me, it's this. <laughs> 
Not only did the guard firing his gun just so happen to strike the door lock, but doing so actually opened the door at the exact time required to knock out the other two guards. Really? So, yes, The Incredibles has its writing flaws, as does every movie that's ever been released. But what you'll notice is that I was able to summarize every single significant flaw with that movie's script in a span of less than two minutes. Whereas it's taken me almost four hours to dissect the monster that is Incredibles 2. There is a far greater quantity of errors in the sequel script when compared to the first film by an exponential amount to the point where it's not even a close competition. Furthermore, the degree to which these problems affect the story are far more significant in the sequel. It's much easier to accept a handful of conveniences with one or two logical breaks than it is to accept a story where everything fails to function properly, and the core of the plot makes absolutely no sense at all. It's just like I said in the first video. Basically, every movie is going to have its share of writing problems, as no movie is perfect, but not every movie is going to have the same amount of issues, nor will those issues all carry the same amount of significance. When it comes to the big stuff, foundational plot beats for how and why the characters move through the story, how the action is choreographed, and how everybody makes use of their powers among other things, The Incredibles knocked it out of the ballpark, especially in regards to the villain's plan. Of all the plot-related elements to compare across the two movies, the way the villains are written is possibly the most egregious. Syndrome was a villain who was born out of a logical and empathetic backstory, where you could not only understand exactly how Buddy became Syndrome, but understand why and empathize with him just a little bit, while still being able to acknowledge that what he's been doing and what he plans to do is horrific. Speaking of which, his plan was as well thought out as it possibly could have been. To create a robot so powerful that he was the only person in the world that could stop it because he had direct control over it, so that he could become the hero he always dreamed of as a kid, and then one day retire and live off the rest of his days by selling his technology and watering down the value of superheroes when everyone is able to be like him. And to do that, he called out all the superheroes from the glory days one by one to find the weaknesses in the design of the Omnidroid, fix them for the next version, call on the next hero, and then rinse and repeat until he finally created the ultimate robot. It allows him to beta test his robot and find all its flaws without putting himself or any of his crew in danger. It eliminates any potential competition he could face when he finally returns to the mainland because anyone else that stood a chance to upstage him would have already been killed on the island. And finally, it allows him to take his revenge on Mr. Incredible by having him be the final hero he calls out. Of course, he has to come up with a way to convince the heroes to fly out there in the first place which he is able to do by constructing a story that would be entirely believable. They're told by Mirage that she represents a secret government society, which explains why nobody has ever heard of them before, and would also make sense considering the advanced technology they're capable of using. This government society had created an artificial intelligence that got too smart for its own good, and turned rogue, which is not only something that had been seen so often before, thus making it easy for the heroes to accept, as further proven by the fact that the Omnidroid growing smart enough to think for itself is exactly what happens by the end of the movie. The idea that they can't track its exact position but have a general idea of where it is would be a reasonable estimate to make considering there's only so many places that a giant robot can hide in an island like this. And that if they know where it was unleashed, it wouldn't take too much work to create a broad map of where they think it could be located. And of course, dropping the heroes in from the air and thus being able to control where they roam prevents them from seeing the facilities while also being a justifiable covert insertion. Everything about Syndrome makes perfect logical sense, which is why I have always referenced him as one of Pixar's best villains, if not the best. They clearly took the time to think about what a character like this would want to do and what would be the most effective way to do it. Now compare that to Evelyn Dever, whose entire motivation is based on achieving a goal that was already accomplished 15 years ago, outlawing superheroes, and every step she takes along the way only serves to get in the way of that objective. It would make much more sense if she actually was trying to sabotage these situations, but that's not the case. She is handcrafting catastrophes deliberately set up so that Elastigirl will be able to save the day far from home style, essentially making her look as good as possible in the eyes of the public, which is directly at odds with what she's hoping to achieve. That being to prove once and for all how worthless and horrible superheroes are, as well as being at odds with the screen slaver personality she set up. They have absolutely nothing to do with each other, and the hypothetical screen slaver villain was far more intriguing and ripe with potential than what they actually went with. And as a result, we have one of the most nonsensical antagonists I have ever seen in any movie ever. Even if you want to talk broadly rather than focusing on the individual mechanics that make up the story, the pacing of this movie almost seems paradoxical. It simultaneously progresses between scenes at breakneck speed to the point where it has to forget how calendar days work and skip over huge chunks of time, yet also feels like half of the movie is filled with a bunch of nothing until they abruptly try to stitch the two halves together. Both Bob and Helen's story threads face the exact same problem. 
the roller coaster of Bob parenting the kids goes from him being able to hold down the fort to him being horrendously sleep deprived and launching into an angry tirade in the span of three days, when it should absolutely have taken way longer than this for his demeanor and personality to change so drastically. And you might think that they keep this part of the movie moving as fast as they do so they can keep up with Helen's adventure and they can intersect in a moment when Bob and the kids are at their best, but that shouldn't need to be the case because Helen's plot thread also escalates far too quickly. They want you to believe that leaders from all around the world completely changed their minds on a law that had been unchallenged for a decade and a half, and that they were mechanically capable of executing on the logistical process required to actually overturn it in less than a week. To put it simply, I do not believe you. You are telling me all of the lies. You can't open the movie in the way that you do and then immediately double back on all of it in an instant like it's nothing, which I suppose opens the door for a wider discussion in regards to the film's world building. They absolutely cannot make up their minds on whether or not superheroes are illegal. The ending of The Incredibles very heavily implied that superheroes would no longer be illegal, or that even if the law wasn't going to officially change, police officers and government representatives would no longer be actively trying to arrest them as they understand that they are nothing but a net positive to society, as supported both by this conversation in the car, and the fact that said conversation is immediately followed up with the fact that the Incredibles don't hesitate for even a second to fight the Underminer, to the point where they apparently went to the track meet either with the superhero suits already on, or at the very least in their possession in case something like this happened, seems to make it pretty clear that the ultimate conclusion was that supers were, in fact, allowed to come out of hiding and a new era of glory days were about to begin, only to cut from this ending to the beginning of Incredibles 2, which takes place literally seconds later, during which the family is arrested for committing the terrible crime of simply being superheroes and using their powers to help. Uh, hello? Obviously this incident is their fault because Bob destroyed the control panel which led to the destruction on the surface. Okay, that is not something the police are aware of. They only know about things that happened above ground, and they are judging the actions of the Incredibles entirely based on that. And everything they did while above ground was with the intent of saving people's lives or preventing more destruction, which they were almost entirely successful at. And they were entirely successful in regards to preventing more casualties. And in spite of it all, they are still blamed for every single destructive event that took place regarding the Underminer. It's not only embarrassingly incongruent with the first film and makes watching these movies back to back all the more painful, but also inconsistent with events that take place later in this very sequel. Because the police and government were completely up in arms about the Underminer incident and went so far as to literally shut down the relocation program because of it. And yet absolutely nobody seems to care at all while Elastigirl is staking out the hover train. They try to explain this by saying, I know the chief of police. There won't be a problem which is a throwaway line that only causes more problems because it begs the question of why you didn't have any influence with the chief of police in Municiburg, but also doesn't even fix this scene because when she's swerving through the police cars to try to catch up to the train, one of the officers says this. Is that Elastigirl? Meaning that they clearly were not briefed on her presence ahead of time, and that throwaway line was more referring to, in case they bring you in after this is over, we'll make sure you're out of there in no time without any trouble. So it doesn't do anything to explain why the police are totally cool with her being here at this moment in time. The film also absolutely cannot make up its mind on whether or not the general public hates them, irrespective of their legality. You open with these clowns railing on the heroes for doing what they did despite the fact that their involvement was an unambiguous positive for everybody involved in the situation and they did not actively make anything worse, and in fact only made a situation better than it otherwise would have been, and ignoring the fact that this is literally no different than what happened with the on the droid three months ago, except that there actually might have been more collateral damage during that battle. <laughs> The Underminer exists without the Incredibles. The same is not true for Syndrome and the Omnidroid. Oh sorry, what's that? The police weren't aware of the origins of Syndrome, so they couldn't possibly factor that into their assessment of the situation? Correct. They also didn't know about what happened in the tunneler between Mr. Incredible and the Underminer, meaning their judgment of liability in both events is entirely without taking these things into consideration, and the only things that they can go off of are the battles that unfolded on the streets of Municiburg. Battles that resulted in the Incredibles saving countless lives and preventing more damage. But if you're gonna pick one event to cast blame upon them for making things worse, I'd probably go for the one where they consciously launched the on the door directly into a building. Not the one where every act they took only made things better. Yet they want you to believe it makes perfect sense for them to be praised for the former, but arrested and shunned for the latter. And I'm sorry, but that doesn't make any sense at all. And from there, Winston goes on to seemingly support a sentiment from their earlier interrogation by telling our heroes that everybody hates them because they've had their minds warped by what politics 
politicians told them on the news, only to then demonstrate Elastico clearly still having adoring fans even after all this derogatory slander. And not people that you find at her fan club or whatever, just random folks out for a morning drive. And to then go on to show every news station in existence collectively praising Elastigirl for stopping the hover train despite the fact that what she did is exactly the same as her family's previous heroic acts, with the only exception being a total lack of casualties or injured people of any capacity. Which I not only don't believe, but casualties were never something that was highlighted in the context of the Underminer's attack. They actually sought to highlight the opposite when it came to civilians' lives being saved, only to then completely ignore it. The world building in the first Incredibles movie was extremely simplistic and straightforward. It was a universe where superheroes were outlawed, and then by the end of the film, the public opinion had clearly turned in their favor, and their legality was strongly implied to have no longer been enforced. But Incredibles 2 spits in the face of all of that by not only erasing all of its accomplishments, but also just confusing the hell out of me, because it cannot decide what it wants the state of the world to actually be. We aren't talking Toy Story 4 levels of, you genuinely just broke in the entire Toy Story universe and possibly accidentally created a horror series world building failures. It's just a confusing mess that results in an unrecognizable setting from what we're used to, and screams of a rush script that was duct taped together with the last second. Ah, but don't you understand? It's all about the themes! It's not about the logic of the plot or the integrity of the world the plot is set in. What really matters in storytelling is a writer's ability to present a compelling, meaningful message for people to learn from. People like to say that a lot in defense of poorly written movies. Any criticism of the consistency of a story's logic will often be countered by simply saying, that's not what the movie's really about. The movie's about, insert theme here. You're getting hung up on all the minor details. Well, I think at this point I've spoken enough about how these minor details really aren't all that minor at all, so let me instead focus on the idea that themes are of greater importance to a story's quality than a consistent plot. Themes and moral messages can make for a great element of a story. There are a lot of really meaningful things you can take away from some of my favorite movies of all time. As a matter of fact, one of my proudest pieces of writing that I've ever done was that section in part 2 of my Toy Story 4 series where I broke down Buzz's character arc in the first Toy Story movie, and the thematic relevance it has to the real world and that you don't have to be some super epic awesome space ranger to be accepted and loved. You just have to be who you are. Thematic through lines can be what links a story together and gives it a greater purpose, but they cannot be the sole redeeming element of a movie. The themes of Toy Story can be really impactful in isolation, but will ultimately fall flat on their face without compelling characters to root for and without a competent plot to stand behind. But far too often what will happen is you will have people trying to say, just think of the ideas and the messages the movie was trying to get across, when the message in question is dependent on a plot that fails to function on the most basic of levels, or that is directly at odds with the characters in plot. If I could propose a question to anybody that immediately jumps to themes when trying to defend a movie, would it simply be enough if you had a movie where a guy walked into an empty room, sat down on a chair, and then rattled off a bunch of one-liner themes? Would that be enough for you to say, this is a brilliant movie. Look at all the messages it's trying to get across. I'm going to assume, in good faith, that you would say no, as I imagine everybody would. I've obviously chosen an extremely hyperbolic example for the sake of argumentation, so I would imagine that you would not be content with this as a story, right? Well, if that's the case, if you agree that this absurd hypothetical is a pathetic excuse of a story and that, but the themes would not work as an excuse in its defense, then I have some bad news for you, because what I've just described is functionally no different from how Incredibles 2 handles its themes. To even call them themes is laughable. All this movie does is bring up a topic for discussion with one or two lines and then stops at that. No development, no expansion, nothing. Just a person sitting in a room rattling off a bunch of one-liner themes, and all the thought-provoking messages in the world don't mean diddly squat if all you're gonna do is pay lip service to those ideas and spend absolutely no time diving into the intricacies of them. This is true for every single idea the movie tries to bring up. Politicians moral bankruptcy, legality versus morality, the corruption of people's minds in the hands of screens, and by extension the danger of people's entire view of the world being funneled through news networks, wealthy individuals escaping harsh punishment, etc, etc. The closest you're gonna get to something of substance is the conversation between Helen and Evelyn about whether the buyer or the seller is more important, but it has absolutely absolutely nothing to do with the plot or characters and just comes off as a poorly placed mid-roll ad popping up in the middle of a YouTube video. It doesn't connect in any way to the rest of the content that you're experiencing and only serves to confuse you. And it's the same thing with a speech from the screen slaver. I genuinely praise the construction of that scene and how the events on screen and themes directly correlate with one another, but all that praise only holds up if the screen slaver was actually the villain of the film, but they're not. Their goals are directly contradictory to what Evelyn actually wants, so this once again falls 
falls flat on its face no matter how thought-provoking it may be in isolation. I legitimately do not understand how anybody could unironically praise the movie for its thematic depth, because at least with Toy Story 4, the movie did develop its themes. There are messages it wants to get across that link all the major plot beats and character arcs together. The problem is that said themes were morally reprehensible and, in some cases, outright contradicted. But at least there was a through line its defenders were able to try to grab onto. Incredibles 2 just has actually nothing to go off of. Like, how do you look at anything this movie tries to say and come to a conclusion that isn't just, damn, that's a great theme, let's see how you develop, oh, oh, oh no, oh, that's it, oh, okay, bye then, better luck next time. To be blunt, it's just a pathetic attempt at communicating ideas to an audience, resulting in a film that's frankly thematically vacant. And with that, we now arrive at the final element of storytelling, the thing that matters more than anything else, the thing that could have still made this movie somewhat redeemable even if everything else about it had completely and utterly fallen apart at the seams. The integrity of the characters. But sadly, the characters of Incredibles 2 are either inferior, stripped down, incompetent versions of their former selves, or newly introduced members of the cast that had nothing except generating more toy sales for Disney. Here's a fun little game we can play. What can you tell me about the personalities of all of these new superheroes? I give you five seconds to name a single character trait for each one. See, it's a trick question because there isn't actually anything substantive about any of them. Let's see, uh, the Crusher guy is dumb. Void is starstruck and nervous. Reflux is, uh, old? Yeah, no, I got nothing. These new superheroes can't even honestly be called characters. They're here to be obstacles for Dash and Violet to deal with as they make their way to the Hydrofoil. The only one who gets anything close to a personality is Void, and even that is an extremely generous summation. Hell, the animator's commentary of the movie explicitly refers to them as being one-dimensional. These are really some of the funnest characters that we animated on the show because they're a little more one-dimensional, which makes them a little more caricatured, and that's always a little more fun to animate. Hey, pro tip, if your animators are describing your characters as being one dimensional maybe you should go back to the drawing board. And no, I'm not saying that every single one of these characters needs to have super in-depth development. Although we know it's not impossible for superhero movies to respectfully juggle a large amount of characters, I would much rather advocate for a shrinking the number of new characters and then hardcore focusing in on the ones you have left. Brick and the Electricity Man are no more fleshed out of characters than these other random superheroes that show up for the signing ceremony and then pretend to be important during the big final hero shot. I think it's safe to say by this point that I've already thoroughly ripped Evil Endeavor a new one and I don't really have much to say about her brother. He's a superhero fanboy, and he's very likable, and they try to use him as a red herring, but it fails miserably because his sister is literally called Evil Endeavor. He's a means to progress the story as the one who organizes everything because he apparently has every possible political influence he could ever need for things to happen, and nothing beyond that. And is it even worth talking about the walking joke that is Tony Reidinger? Much like Winston, he isn't an actual character. He's the driving force of Violet's story, and we only care about him because she does. We still don't know anything about him except that. And it's not like I don't like strong girls. I'm pretty secure, manhood. Wise. Because they really wanted you to make sure you knew that about him, of all things. But wait! I hear you crying out. It's okay if these minor side characters aren't well fleshed out because the focus is all about our classic family of superheroes and their close friends who are basically seen as part of their family now. Well, first of all, I don't think we should be giving side characters a pass considering the fact that the first movie didn't waste their inclusions and even characters like Mirage got something of a mini arc. Even the goddamn tricycle kid had a nice little callback. But fine. Let's turn our attention away from the less significant characters and redirect it towards the heroes that we fell in love with 14 years ago. Well, sadly, things are actually looking much worse over on that side. The only two characters left undamaged from the original film were Edna Mode and Lucius, or Frozen if you prefer. Edna's implementation in this movie was impressively and appreciably limited to how they could have handled her, and during what small amount of time she's on screen for, she's thankfully never dragged through the mud. Frozone is still a chill character that has maintained his cool-headed personality, but um, Tiss, his proficiency on the battlefield, most of the time, and has gone even further than the first film in terms of putting himself on the line to protect not only the innocent civilians of the city, but also the children whom he considers to be family. But everybody else was thrown into a wood chipper in this movie. We're gonna go through every last one of them, starting with the character who was propped up to be the main event this time around, Helen Parr or Elastigirl. She's the star of the show. She's in the spotlight now. The main plot of this movie mostly revolves entirely around her until the third act, and all of that was a huge part of this film's marketing push. This was Elastigirl's chance to shine all by herself, so surely, if they were going to nail any one of their characters, they'd make sure they wrote her properly. 
right? Nope, not even slightly. To say that they've done her character a disservice would be far too generous. They've mercilessly destroyed her. First and foremost, the unmitigated stripping away of her intelligence to the point where Helen is now completely incompetent. This includes things like not breaking the screens in the TV station to free them from mind control or concocting a plan to catch a screen slaver that involves her actively staring into another screen, and especially her suspicion, or rather lack thereof, about the screen slaver. I'm not expecting her to have immediately suspected something was amiss with Evelyn due to the fact that her name was literally evil endeavor, because she would have no reason to suspect that people would actually be given Ace Attorney name puns in their world. But she, of all people, should have been at least slightly reluctant to trust the word of the wealthy businessman promising a return of superheroes considering what just happened to them in the last movie. Yet she isn't, and in fact jumps at the chance to get back out there as Elastigirl. And she absolutely should have been able to deduce that the pizza guy she caught at the apartment complex wasn't actually the screen slaver, especially after just discovering the hypnotic goggles in the fake evil lair. She has seen people act exactly like this after breaking out of the screen slaver's hypnosis multiple times. But magically now, she forgets all those times because the plot can't happen otherwise. Not only should she have known she didn't actually catch the screen slaver, but she also probably should have figured out that Evelyn was at least partially involved with these disasters, considering the fact that she is a tech genius responsible for all the technology they made use of thus far, and was the one to direct her towards the fake hideout in the first place. And she absolutely should have realized what was up as soon as she saw her suit cam feed on that monitor. There was no other logical way to interpret that other than, oh, Evelyn must be responsible for this because I know my suit cam is closed circuit. And upon deducing that, she definitely should not have kept her hands directly in front of Evelyn. But even if we were just to take the movie as is and disregard the idea that she 100% should have been able to crack the case far sooner than she did, a very simple action she could have taken in this movie would have been to simply close her eyes the second she saw Evelyn about to press the button again to fake her out and get the upper hand as soon as she's released from the restraints. But she never even once thinks of trying to deceive her like this, which is just the straw that breaks the camel's back in regards to her rampant incompetence. Helen was not this stupid in the original film. Her perceptive capabilities were on full display during major key moments over the course of the story, and that intelligence carried over into her superhero actions. Yet this film has turned her into an idiot all for the sake of keeping the plot moving. But far more infuriating than that is that thanks to Incredibles 2, her moral fortitude is in the pits after this movie, and that is made crystal clear from the opening scene, where she just sits around doing nothing to help the civilians until it's way too late. She could have gone with Bob to help him take down the Underminer, or she could have stayed above ground to help clear people out of the way as opposed to having a nap while off screen until the movie decides she was needed again, followed by a dinner conversation in which this exchange of dialogue happens. Did we do something wrong? No. Yes. Meaning that she unironically believes that Dash and Violet's decision to save these people's lives, in addition to her decision to save people's lives, were morally incorrect. Utterly unbelievable that her character would ever say something like that. But that is nothing. Absolutely nothing compared to this disaster of a scene. What were you people thinking? I actually cannot wrap my head around how you can have her so nonchalantly ignore all these innocent people when she knows they're seconds away from being blown to smithereens. This is not Elastigirl, protector of Unisaburg who put herself and by extension her family's life on the line to keep the city and its occupants safe. This is an imposter masquerading around in a rip-off suit. There is no defending Helen in this scene. The fact that she didn't even try to save them is absolutely inexcusable and unacceptable considering considering that she's supposed to be the role model and star of this movie. Something that is only made worse by scenes like this where she decides it's time to have another nap because she apparently forgot about the back half. Ah! But as if all that wasn't enough, Incredibles 2 also completely undoes the development she had as a character and the relationship she formed with every member of her family. She's reverted all the way back to the beginning of the first movie where she apparently has absolutely no faith whatsoever in Dash and Violet's abilities as superheroes which invalidates everything the first movie was all about. Out. And just generally speaking, she's a total asshole to her family now, being a complete hypocrite about resuming hero work when superheroes are outlawed while preaching otherwise to her family as well as doing the same thing she treated her husband for in the first movie, which isn't at all alleviated by the movie's desperate attempts to lampshade this problem, as well as demonstrating no concern for them whatsoever as she is instead focused on riding the nostalgia high of reliving her glory days until the climax where she suddenly decides to pretend to love them again for no reason despite this payoff not feeling at all earned and being directly at odds with how she's acted this whole time without even a trace of build-up to it whatsoever. Helen's character has been completely decimated in terms of her intelligence, moral principles, and development from the first movie, and she was marketed as being the protagonist of this story. How utterly embarrassing. 
embarrassing. Though, I suppose, not quite as embarrassing as how Bob is portrayed in this movie, because his competence has been even more thoroughly obliterated than Helen's. Her stupidity mostly boils down to her inability to deduce the truth behind a screensaver with a few of the moments of idiocy sprinkled in for good measure. But I don't even think there's a single scene where Bob does anything even remotely approaching the realm of competence. It starts as early as his first battle with the Underminer. Actually, no, sooner than that. Before he even gets the chance to go one-on-one -on -one with him, he pulls a screenslaver and stands there monologuing to him instead of just sneaking up behind him, bopping him on the head and getting it over with. But then, even once he gets inside the tunneler in a straight-up fist fight, the Underminer is somehow still capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Bob. This should have been an instant knockout, literally the shortest fight in fighting history. A gentle reminder that Bob knocked the prototype on the droid halfway across the forest with a single punch before he got himself in shape. One punch against this little mole prick should have sent him flying to the moon. And don't even get me started on this joke of a fight between him and Helen. He didn't even try to put up a fight here, and he's just as much of a laughing sock went up against the knockoff superheroes. But all of those indictments are only taking into consideration his combat capabilities. In regards to his day-to-day -day life and just basic decision-making, it might even be more insulting. First up, he apparently can't handle himself in an interrogation when the truth is categorically on his side when he was quite adept at verbally holding his own in the first movie, both during the midnight argument with Helen and during the last meeting with his boss. Second, he can't figure out that his actions are what led to Tony's mind erasure when he should have known ahead of time this was going to happen, and definitely should have thought to be clear and concise to Dicker about what he wanted him to do. To make matters worse, when it all blows up in his face, he consistently thinks of the most idiotic possible plans to fix Violet's love life, and then there's this stupid scene. Hey, you did this! Can you undo it? I can't get to the engine room! I hate this scene so goddamn much you have no idea. They have made Bob so irredeemably stupid that he literally cannot think of a single way to get into the engine room. Not even one. When there's, like, a million ways he could have done that. Did you guys forget about how level-headed and capable Bob was in the first movie? How he managed to deal with both the cat stuck in the tree and the robbery simultaneously without breaking a sweat? Or how he had the foresight to be able to detect that there was a bomb in the bank from the second he crashed through the window? Or how he evaded the Omnidroid's detection by hiding directly beneath it in its only blind spot? Or that he was the one to not only trick the Omnidroid into defeating itself the first time, but who also thought of the idea to use that knowledge from his first battle to defeat the final version at the end of the movie? Yeah, well, absolutely none of that is present here whatsoever. He doesn't even know what the word combustion means. He's such a blithering idiot in this movie that I almost feel like they intentionally gave him brain damage just to make Helen look better by comparison. Now, where have I heard that before? Only much like that other movie, they still failed to do that properly because Helen's intelligence ain't holding up all that much better than Bob's is. And also just like Helen, all his development from The Incredibles was reversed and brought back to the status quo from the beginning of that movie. His decision to stay home and watch the kids is one born out of reluctance and one that only brings him pain and frustration. He firmly shot down the idea of Helen getting a job and him watching the kids initially and only agreed to it in the end because of his petty desire to get back into the superhero spotlight. He doesn't want a better world for his kids. He may tell Helen that's why she should take the job, but it's all a front and she ultimately gets him to admit that the real reason why he wants her to go is so that he can have the choice to get back out there and be a superhero again, when he should be jumping at the chance to spend more quality time with his children. The entire point of his character arc from the first film was him realizing that his greatest adventure was his family, and how he almost missed it because he was so blinded by the nostalgic rush of reliving the glory days. He was always the reason why his family would be uprooted and relocated because he couldn't control himself in his day-to-day -day life. But he finally comes around by the end and sees how important his family really was to him all along without realizing it for so many years, even if through the grimmest of circumstances. And his priority following that point appears, on the surface, to still being the star of the show. But after Helen whittles him down enough, he finally bursts out that... I can't lose you again! I can't. Not again. I'm not strong enough. Thus leading to the final climactic battle where he knows now that he doesn't have to do this alone. He never had to. He can stand side by side with his family and work together to save the day, leading to an optimistic conclusion where the family's relationship is healed and they're closer than ever before, and he's committed to being a better father above all else while still being able to resume his superhero duties not as a one-man show, but as a team, and as the incredible family that they are. Only for Incredibles 2 to come along and ruin 
all of that by reducing Bob back to the childless position of wanting to be Mr. Incredible again with no concerns whatsoever for anybody else. Even going so far as to imply that his wife isn't as good as him at being a superhero. Literally, who are you? What happened to you in the three seconds that took place between movies for you to have such a drastic shift in priorities? You know, I'm starting to think that... I never look back, darling. It distracts from the now. ...was just a mission statement when writing the script. That's the adults taken care of, and by taken care of, I mean that only in the meanest way possible, because the writers certainly didn't actually take care of them. That's just as true for their children. We'll start with Violet, that snobby little... I can't say. Let's not beat around the bush here. She's just terrible to everyone around her. She's downright mean to her family members especially her little brother, for things that are not at all their fault, with the obvious reference being the scene in the climax where she bites Dash's head off for losing Jack-Jack. You know, a baby with the ability to travel between dimensions that clearly neither of you can control even when you're both right next to him. And you are especially in no position to criticize him when you were the one to decide on going with the stupid plan to have you run reconnaissance instead of Dash doing it, or both of you doing it together. And before you say it, yes, she and Dash had their arguments in the first movie like any siblings are bound to engage in. It was it would be fair to say she was combative with her little brother, but their relationship had been mended by the end, having bonded closer than ever before after the adventure of a lifetime and nearly dying several times. Now cut to this movie, where she hates everyone and everything and is completely awful to Dash in every single scene for no justifiable reason, even after all they went through the first time around, and she's not any nicer to the rest of her family. Yeah, I gotta say, not really seeing that self-assured, nonchalant girl you became at the end of The Incredibles. <laughs> The only person she's not a whiny asshole to is Tony, but that's because she's so head over heels in love with him that she winds up coming off as a creepy stalker instead, which is basically her entire role in this movie. To be the big sad because Tony forgot about her and their movie date, and then to be the big mad because Bob made him forget her. There is no word for this other than embarrassing. Tony wasn't Violet's entire personality in the first film. He was just the vehicle through which we could most clearly see how Violet's personality and confidence had evolved by the end. Yet suddenly in Incredibles 2, the only thing that seems Seems to give her life any sense of purpose is Tony Reidinger, which again is not congruent with the aloof personality she had adopted at the end of The Incredibles. But more importantly, does it not seem just a tiny bit confusing and possibly even somewhat awkward that a film so clearly focused on making sure it specifically propped up Elastigirl, Void, and Evelyn as the stars of the show, then proceeded to give Violet the most stereotypical and reductive plotline imaginable where she basically has a mental breakdown because her crush forgot about her? Because I don't know, man, that seems a bit contradictory victory to me. Then there's the other Par sibling who, while not being anywhere near as insufferable, still sustains significant damage from its previous iteration. Dash is utterly useless in this movie. His only role is to be the person that pushes everybody's buttons constantly, and to be Violet's younger brother sidekick for the climax. He doesn't get any kind of character arc, or at least any kind of moment of significant growth. The first movie gave him an action scene all to himself, where he finally got to really put the limits of his speed to the test, discovering how much of a little badass he really was being able to run all on water, and it also gave him this moment in the forest where he fearlessly jumps at this soldier, putting himself in great danger all to protect his sister. But he gets nothing of the sort in Incredibles 2. Unless you're gonna tell me that him learning to be good at math is his character arc, in which case, excuse me while I- ah! Because that is a laughable thing to reduce a character to. Oh, what's that? Last time you got to put your powers to the test and grow closer with your family, you finally reaching a compromise to let out all your energy instead of acting out? Yeah, well now you gotta get good at math. Have fun, nerd. But honestly, you could have made something like this work. You might think this sounds cringe, but imagine if there was a problem on the boat that would necessitate Dash's math skills to solve. Now, admittedly, I don't know what good fractions and percentages and demisoles Decimals. would do in a situation like this, but maybe you could have had Dash be a bit ahead of the curve when it comes to his math classes and tackling some more advanced algebraic concepts, giving even more reasoning for why Bob is having a hard time understanding the method of teaching, and then having him use those concepts in some way to help save the day. Because as it stands, all Dash gets to do is make an owl spin his head around and then, surprise, push another button to pull Bob up from down below. Do you guys remember Dash in the first movie? He may not have had a ton of super important decisions to make, but any chance he had to act of his own accord, he demonstrated an impressive amount of competence with things such as swinging around in the jungle to outmaneuver the saucers or by tricking two of them into crashing into each other. He can do more than just push buttons for Christ's sake. And I can't even say that, well, at least Dash's personality was kept intact, because outside of one or two scenes where his reactions actually make sense in accordance with what's going on, he's been turned into a psychotic little asshole in this movie, being significant 
significantly ruder and inconsiderate than he ever was in the first movie, and for absolutely no reason at all. The dude was literally ready to blow up an entire room full of people because, haha, aren't explosions so fun, lol? And there's never any justification for this. It's just all treated as totally okay, normal behavior. But that was not the case in the first film. He understands dangerous and powerful objects when confronted with them. He doesn't just stand idly by when he feels the rising heat in the cave. He was having fun with the reaver, but as soon as he realized the genuine danger he was in, he shifted moods in an instant. Considering how close he came to being blown up by airborne missiles being launched at the plane, I find it absolutely baffling that he is so careless with the rocket car in this scene. Also, as far as him acting out in short little bursts like this, there were justifications for why Dash acted the way that he did, and even with those justifications, he still never went to these lengths. There's an important distinction to make between being a mischievous little boy and being an inconsiderate, irresponsible prick. Dash in The Incredibles was the former, a mischievous kid who still cared about his family when it really came down to it and who had learned to move past his more immature desires after a compromise was finally reached with what he wanted to do. Dash in the sequel is the latter and it makes no sense at all. And before anyone asks, no. I'm not saying Dash's arc was that he would never do anything immature or rude ever again for the rest of his childhood. That's silly. But what I am saying is that Dash was acting out to an abnormal degree which the characters drew explicit attention to and letting him go out for sports at the end of the day was what would finally help quell those behavioral outbursts in addition to just generally having grown closer to his family after all they'd been through together. A development for his character that was sadly entirely absent from Incredibles 2 because the focus of this movie was never about the kids. Because they were never supposed to be the stars of the show despite the title implying otherwise. The main attraction was always supposed to be Helen Parr as Elastigirl, something which is by no means a bad thing in isolation. If you cut out well, most of this movie, and just edit together the sequences where Elastigirl is fighting the screen slaver, you would actually end up with a pretty damn good short film. Now, before you jump all over me for saying that, obviously you still need to fix a few things. I broke them down throughout the course of the series. You would still need to fix things about each action scene, but that's it. Only a couple small tweaks would need to be made to perfect that part of the movie, as long as you divorce it from the wider goal of the screen slaver. But if an Elastigirl spinoff was what you wanted to make, then you should have just made that instead. I would have absolutely absolutely gone to see that movie. Any chance we got to see her show off her skill set entirely by herself in the first movie was excellent, and I would have loved to see an entire film's worth of that, but only in an Elastigirl spin-off movie. I didn't come to see Incredibles 2 because I wanted to see a single one of the Incredibles fighting crime. I came to see Incredibles 2 because you blue balls me with this cliffhanger with the promise of seeing the entire family coming together to fight crime. And before you question it, yes, I would absolutely apply this exact same principle to all the other characters. If it were Bob doing all the action in this movie and Helen was the one who stayed home with the kids, I would say the exact same thing that I'm saying now. You should never have made a movie called Incredibles 2 if the focus of it was only going to be on one of the characters and not all of them fighting together outside of two scenes. And what two scenes we got were underwhelming at best and broken at worst. The opening scene, despite ostensibly having through the roof stakes with a giant drill tearing its way through the city, is really nothing more than characters individually doing something moderately cool one by one and that's it. And as for the final scene, you could have made the best fight scene in the series by having the kids use their powers to battle their parents and having to figure out a way to win and get those goggles off without actually hurting them to any significant degree. But you pulled the rug out from under me yet again and chickened out of the fight and then proceeded to make Dash and Violet do basically nothing for the rest of this battle. Lame doesn't even begin to describe it. I didn't want another Incredibles movie if all you were going to do was give me a role reverse version of the first movie's general structure. And at the end of the day, that's what they wanted to accomplish with Incredibles 2. You crafted the most brain-dead story possible with a completely illogical villain who only exists because of an inability to keep your world-building consistent, all of which facilitates the destruction of every single lovable character from the first movie with the exception of Frozone and Edna. And all of it was in favor of one common goal, to revert everything back to the status quo of the first movie, to reset the status of the legality of superheroes. Helen's development with trusting your kids as well as her position on being superheroes at all. Bob's development as a nostalgia-obsessed father missing his greatest adventure, Violet's lover's quarrel, and so many other things, all so that they could, ironically enough, relive the glory days of the series by replaying the hits of that original magnificent story that took the world by storm even at the cost of the satisfaction of its ending. It's all so depressing. 
Toy Story 4 is a movie that makes me legitimately angry. It was something I never had any genuine hope for whatsoever going in, and after actually watching it, I realized that it was based on a concept for a story that never could have worked no matter what. There is no way to write the story they try to tell in Toy Story 4 without assassinating Woody's character. It was a hopeless movie from day one that never should have been made under any circumstances. But Incredibles 2 was something that I was genuinely excited to see after years of anticipation following the original's cliffhanger. I was thrilled that we would finally get the continuation of their story that we always wanted to see, because there was potential in a sequel to The Incredibles. There were ways to take the story that would have felt natural and not at all forced. And even with a story we did get, it's not irredeemable. Believe it or not, we can work with what we have in regards to the screen slaver. The fake villain that is presented to the audience is one ripe with potential that would perfectly tie in with Evelyn's actual backstory. Make her somebody who hates screens because of how they've warped everybody into believing the power of fictional horror heroics, thus leading to her father's death because of his desire to try to protect his family all by himself, and then make that the core of her motivation. Don't center her motive around a goal that was already accomplished 15 years ago that she's actively working to undo. It would make so much more sense if she actually had the screen slaver's desires rather than the dumbassery they actually went with. And you know what? It actually would have given thematic relevance to the raccoon fight. You'd obviously need to change the specifics to make it not incredibly stupid in execution, but thematically, the idea of Jack-Jack looking at the actual on the TV and then going to fight the raccoon as a result would tie into Evelyn's hatred of screens and the fictional fabricated confidence that they facilitate. Bob's story of staying home to take care of the kids and facing the challenges that it brings about isn't inherently a bad concept. If you simply shift his motivation from, I'm begrudgingly doing this and assuming it will be easy so I can be a hero again, to, I'm reluctant to do this because I don't think I'm good enough but I'm going to do it anyway because I want to make a better world for my kids, I believe my wife is the best choice for the mission, and I want to make up for all those years that I lost, you would make this part of the story entirely in character for his beliefs, and you could work to actually make his slow descent into madness more believable if you make the situations come about not as a result of his rampant incompetence, but because there's simply too much going on for any one person to handle, which would only be further aided by a decision to actually give this side of the family some kind of crime-fighting angle to deal with that could ultimately tie into the screen slaver, thus giving him even more to worry about on top of the daily parenting duties. The undermining revenge causing further damage to the reputation of superheroes could have worked if things had actually been consciously made worse by deliberate decisions made by the Incredibles a la Captain America Civil War, as opposed to presenting them doing the absolute best job they possibly could have to stop the Tunneler and actually saving many people's lives in the process, only for the movie to then try to convince you that they actually just made everything worse. Void, as a superhero, could have been awesome to watch because, let's be real, portals rock. Love them. Warping the fabric of reality to bring two points together and swish through them with satisfying chains of momentum is lovely stuff, but you need to place limitations on these things, and had they outlined clear and concise rules for where and how Void can place her portals and then design the action scenes around that she could have worked. Cut back on the amount of new superheroes and flesh out the ones that are there, either cut the random soapbox moments or commit to expanding upon them, stop adding new abilities to Jack-Jack's arsenal, make the screen slavers fake there be located in some underground or at least extremely remote shack somewhere where it wouldn't be incredibly obvious to anyone with a functioning pair of eyes and where innocent civilians wouldn't be horribly killed and then promptly forgotten about. And on that note, don't have Helen forget about the goddamn bomb in the building and getting everybody killed, have Dash actually use his abilities in the final battle to tie it into the opening scene. There is so, so much about this movie that could have worked flawlessly if only a few things were different. And there already are scenes in this movie that are genuinely good that need even fewer fixes. The motorcycle hover train chase is legitimately excellent and the only part of the movie I actually look forward to watching. All you have to do is not have Helen forget about the back half of the train and maybe build in some kind of GPS device to her motorcycle to provide a more solid justification for her shockingly intimate knowledge of the city, and there are even scenes you don't need to do anything at all to change. There is good stuff here, and what's not good has little nuggets of potential that would require so few changes to make them shine that it's actually painful. That's what makes this film so frustrating. The only way to fix Toy Story 4 is to throw it in the trash and start again from scratch, but they were so close to perfection with Incredibles 2. Even if you wanted to commit to the idea of essentially making an Elastigirl spin-off and marketing that as a sequel to The Incredibles, you could have made the concept of the story you set out to tell work if you just made a few changes. And you know what? Maybe they would have made those changes if they had the time to do so. But as you know by now, if you watch my Toy Story 4 series, Incredibles 2 lost a whole year's worth of production time because of Toy Story 4's delay. A whole year's worth of script revision gone, and they had to just throw something at the wall hoping it was gonna stick and then go full seam ahead on the animation. You may have noticed that there were no references to the director's commentary track for this series. Well, that's because there is no director's commentary. But as I've alluded to,
to a few times, there is an animator's commentary, and something you'll hear if you listen to that is lines like this. We had to move so quickly on this film. We were really all doing the work at the same time. Animation, lighting, crowds, effects. Everybody was working on top of one another, including characters and sets. This was a great way to sort of test how we were going to get through this entire film in record time. Maybe you think I'm reading too much into it, but lines like that signal to me that the Incredibles 2 team had to scramble like rats caught red-handed in a kitchen to get this thing out on time in a manner that was even remotely coherent. I believe they tried. I honestly believe that every single person at Pixar was trying their absolute best to deliver something they hoped people would love under the ridiculous time constraint that they had to work with. And I'm not saying this time crunch excuses the problem. I've spent the last four hours ranting about how much this movie pisses me off. Toy Story 2 is a perfect example of how something great can come out of the worst production circumstances imaginable. All I'm saying is that it explains a lot about how rushed everything seems. How the film seems to be moving at breakneck pace without spending any time on fleshing anything out and any attempts they do make to explain things feel so slapdash and nonsensical, it could only make sense that they were just desperately trying to patch up the holes as they went along. Unlike Josh Cooley, who I earnestly think either had an outright hatred for or at the absolute best horrific misunderstanding of the Toy Story characters, I believe Brad Bird had nothing but the best intentions when it came to making this movie. I'm sure he fought tooth and nail to push Incredibles 2 back to 2020 as soon as he was told he was getting bumped up a year, or at least to push Toy Story 4 back another year, as I don't imagine any director would be content with losing such a significant amount of production time. People had been pestering him for 14 years about making a sequel to The Incredibles, and he always said he wanted to, but that he wouldn't commit to doing it until he had all the pieces in place. You can tell from the way he speaks about his films that he has true blue passion for what he does. He doesn't sound like a soulless robot phoning it in for the big bucks. He sounds like a director with genuine care for the characters and world he's crafted, but he just wasn't given the time to make the masterpiece he wanted and that fans had been waiting for for so long, because Pixar couldn't even fathom the possibility of skipping a year for movie releases. Which is why the only emotion I have left to feel for this film at this point is bitter disappointment. Disappointment at the wasted premise of the screen slaver. Disappointment at the comically inept action when I know they were capable of so much better. And disappointment over how the characters were treated, tossed to the side or heavily reduced in their significance in spite of how hard the first movie works to bring them together as an unstoppable team. All of which is only further exacerbated by the fact that there's likely no hope of us ever getting an Incredibles 3, or even an Incredibles Disney Plus show to fix the damage that's been done, and give us the crime-fighting family action we've wanted to see for so long. But honestly, even if I end up being wrong and one day Pixar suddenly announces plans to continue their adventures, I'm not so sure if I'd actually want that anymore. If you had asked me a decade ago, I'd have said yes to that idea in a heartbeat. But now, after seeing what's become of Pixar, after seeing how low their bar of quality has fallen, seeing their most talented creative minds leave and seeing the profit-driven decisions they're making without a care in the world for how the end product actually turns out, at this point, I just want them to keep their grubby hands off their classic characters for the rest of time. Their last original, and original in quotation marks, movies were embarrassingly horrific and any attempt they've made at giving us a sequel has miserably failed. Yes, two years ago we got Soul, and last year we got Monsters at Work, an example of an emotionally mature masterpiece and an example of a sequel series that had nothing but respect for the characters from Monsters, Inc. while still getting you to empathize with the new recruits. But those are the exceptions, not the rule. Pixar used to be a company I could look to every year and get excited over the newest release. A guaranteed fantastic, or at least good, movie. But I no longer have faith in the studio. Every time they announce a new movie, I'm left thinking, well... Let's hope this one isn't completely awful. Maybe we'll get a 4 out of 10 film this time. But even going in with that dwindling level of optimism is getting harder and harder with each passing year. There's a new Cars series on Disney+, Plus, as well as an Inside Out sequel that was only a rumor when I recorded the script, but has since been officially confirmed at D23 during the editing process. I should be able to look at these and think, WOW, THAT'S AMAZING! MORE ADVENTURES WITH MY FAVORITE CHARACTERS! But now I look at them with nothing but fear, saying, Oh my god, please don't ruin these characters. And the fact that that is my current mindset going into Pixar movies nowadays is utterly depressing because it's never going to change so long as people keep eating it up. It's psychotic, but if people keep coming up with new ways to celebrate mediocrity at best, then Pixar will never have a reason to create something genuinely exceptional 
ever again. This animation studio used to be something truly special, but now they're nothing but a shell of their former selves. All their original creative talent has left, with the only OG left standing being Pete Doctor trying his absolute best to hold this sinking ship together. And financially, I guess they're holding on alright, until recently. But the public perception regarding the studio and its films is starting to radically shift, and not for the better. No longer can I count on them to be able to consistently pour their hearts into a great movie year after year, and if they keep treading on this downward spiral, I fear we may never again see Pixar reach the heights of their glory days. A downward spiral that started all those years ago when they first dented their reputation after having just finished restoring people's faith in the studio by rushing out a terrible sequel about a beloved family of superheroes that deserved so much more than what they got, only to lead into a stream of offensively garbage stories with seemingly no end in sight. But I guess, at the end of the day, you can't count on anyone. Especially not your heroes. Thank you all so much for watching this series, and I really hope you guys enjoyed this adventure. It took way longer to put this together than I thought it was going to, and I fear that I may have, ironically enough, set expectations higher than I could realistically meet because of how long I kept you all waiting for this. So I do sincerely hope you liked watching me tear Incredibles 2 to shreds. While obviously not even coming close to reaching the levels of personal insult that Toy Story 4 did, I was still thoroughly disappointed and frustrated by this movie and realized, as it usually goes, that there was far more broken about this movie than I realized the first time. But hey, at least this time around, there were also some legitimately good scenes every once in a while. If you found my channel through this series, then I think you'll be happy to know that I have other videos tearing terrible Pixar movies to shreds. Perhaps my most noteworthy is my six-hour-long series, How Toy Story 4 Destroyed Everything. If you liked watching me rip apart Incredibles 2, then you'll get double the amount of that in this series. With double the amount of passionate hatred because of how much I love Toy Story and how influential it was to my earliest childhood years. Looking back, there are some technical elements of the series in terms of presentation that I would do differently, and a handful of smaller criticisms that I might have rephrased slightly, but overall, I'm still incredibly proud of those videos and stand by the core arguments confidently. If you're looking for something a bit more recent, I've also made a video about Lightyear. It's probably the most rushed video I've ever made because I really wanted to get it out as soon as possible before people forgot about that movie entirely, and as a result, there are some genuine mistakes that I made due to a lack of appropriate research, and due to the lack of footage, I couldn't really visually demonstrate what I was talking about, but it seems that a lot of people still really liked it, which makes me happy to see. So that may also be something to pique your interest. And for one last piece of Toy Story content, you can check out my 100% serious, not at all sarcastic defense of Toy Story 4. If you're willing to cast your net beyond the realm of Pixar's recently released piles of garbage, the earliest version of my hate-filled reviews comes in the form of my videos talking about Danganronpa 2.5 and Danganronpa 3. I probably look back upon those with the greatest amount of regrets in terms of production because it was my first foray into this type of video and I've learned so much over the past year that I would really want to go back and change in terms of presentation, but I still fully stand by the actual criticisms that I made in regards to those truly terrible terrible shows. And beyond that, there are plenty of other miscellaneous projects that I've made that might pique your interest, from a one-off video ranting about how awful Free Guy is, to a mini-series counting off my 20 favorite and least favorite movies and video games, in-depth videos praising games like Halo Combat Evolved and Dragon's Lair 3D Return to the Lair, the latter of which is my favorite video game of all time. I've gotten many comments from people saying that they had never heard of the game before watching that video, but then after doing so, were convinced to give it a shot and walked away having a fun time. And that is my goal at the end of the day, to bring such an underrated gem of a game to as many people as possible considering the non-existent mainstream attention that it receives. So if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend giving it a watch because I maintain to this day that it is the best piece of analysis I've created on this channel so far. Something else I want to draw attention to is the fact that I have a Patreon page. If you'd like to help me make this channel into a full-time commitment, please consider supporting me over there. I want to once again make it expressly clear that I have no interest in locking Patreon exclusive rewards behind this page. I understand that's kind of counterproductive to encouraging people to donate no special Discord role or behind-the-scenes content or anything like that. But I don't want to make it feel like you're missing out on anything by not donating. I want this to exclusively be something you can participate in only if you are financially able to and if you want to support me in that way, but you should not feel forced in any way to do so. It is simply there as strictly optional if you wish to donate. If you're interested in watching something beyond the realm of film analysis, I recently started up a second channel where I run Let's Plays. I had always made those on my main channel, but given the recent surge in popularity, I decided it made sense to split my content for the appropriate audiences, hence the second channel. If you're interested in seeing me play through video games blind, you can check me out there. 
I'm currently going on a journey to play through as many mainline Sonic games as I can before what I'm sure is going to be an incredible video game comes out later this year. I also stream weekly with my friend Neil playing any number of co-op driven games such as River City Girls and occasionally we'll go live solo if I feel like it. Right now I'm in the process of finishing up Kirby and the Forgotten Land. Let's Plays are certainly not my main priority anymore and in fact I had to cut back pretty hardcore on Let's Play production in order to get my Incredibles 2 series out the door so consistency isn't super great over there right now but you will still be able to look forward to LPs there at least semi consistently if you're interested in that. Now you may be asking yourself what's next for the main channel? Will you be jumping into making the Toy Story 3 praise video since it was the second most popular option in the poll? Well ordinarily the answer would be yes but there's been a bit of an unforeseen development over the last few weeks. See Pixar decided to release a brand new Cars Disney Plus show seemingly out of nowhere. I know what been announced since last year, but I was still largely caught off guard when they dropped their release date last month. And since I still care quite a bit about McQueen and Mater and was quite satisfied with the ending of Cars 3, I am extremely interested in, and also incredibly nervous about, checking out the show in the hopes that it doesn't destroy that ending and make me want to rip it to shreds. Either way, I'll make a video about it. Whether it's a short review giving out my general thoughts on it, which I'm really hoping for, or if it's a full-length analysis of the show, which I really do not want to have to make, I do want to cover the series in some capacity. But aside from that, there's another large-scale project that I want to take care of before making the Toy Story 3 video. And that is a more in-depth critique of Lightyear. Yeah, remember that movie? Sorry if you already forgot it existed. I don't blame you. It seems like the rest of the world did. But the truth is, there's a whole mountain's worth of criticisms that I missed when I first watched the movie back in June. Criticisms I deliberately left out because I didn't have the footage needed to demonstrate what I was talking about, and a handful of mistakes I made in that first video that I would like to amend now that I can actually go through the film scene by scene thanks to its release in Disney Plus last month. So that's a general outline of the next few months for the channel. A review of the new car show, an in-depth critique of Lightyear, and then I can finally sit back and praise my all-time favorite movie. And of course, I haven't forgotten about my series covering the god-awful Halo show. The rest of the world may have purged you from their memory already, but I certainly haven't. This embarrassment has been baked into my brain, and I'm not backing down from tearing it to shreds. One day, Pablo the Penguin. One day. And with that, I must bid you farewell as I return to the world of writing videos yelling about silly animated movies made for kids. Thank you all once again for sticking around the channel and watching my series on Incredibles 2. Be sure to check out my other videos if you're interested, and I hope to see you all soon for whatever you decide to watch next. Goodbye!